you know? And as we drive around the corner, they get RPGs over the shoulders and PKMs and AK-47s, and we're like, All right, okay, this is going south fast. So we drive around and uh, we're wearing, you know, the, uh, the white man dresses, we call them, shemags in our heads, we had beards and stuff. And I'm sitting in the car and they look straight at us. Now, Manny would be slightly darker than I was and not that it really matters, but I mean, he would maybe blend in a little bit more. And I had a shitty AK that I used to carry. It was a good one, but it had no butt stuck on just in the front of the car. And I just held the AK out the window and screamed Al Akbar, <laughs> let off 30 rounds into the air. And they were like, oh, awesome. Yeah, go, <laughs> you know? So we knew there and then, you know, we got to get out of here. Great. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, we good? Yeah. Lorcan. Lorcan. Uh, hello, guys, in a new episode of uh, Planar Tactical Podcasts. With us today is Lorcan, Lorcan <laughs> Byrne. <laughs> Damn it. Um, <laughs> who are you and what are you doing currently? Okay, well, that goes back a long way, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> I'm quite old. No, yeah, so hi, guys. My name is Lorcan, Lorcan Byrne. I, I'm an Irish national. Born and bred in Ireland. Um, yeah, my, my, my journey to Westgate was a, a very winding and long road, which, you know, lots of challenges along the way. Um, uniquely enough, I didn't particularly want to be a soldier when I was a kid. You know, it was one of those weird things. And um, yeah, I wanted to be a carpenter of all things. That was kind of what it was. Carpenter. And just a carpenter. Yeah, That's yeah. a good job. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I wanted Pays to be well. a carpenter. But that was the thing. Uh, Work in Ireland at the time was, was, was very bad. We we're going through a recession and everything else. The military was kind of the safe job. So there was a scheme back then uh, called the apprenticeship, the army apprentice. So you train as a carpenter, an engineer, whatever else. And I thought, well, hey, I like the soldiering because I was a reservist at the time. And um, so I do like the soldiering. It's not like I didn't want to be special forces or do jump out of airplanes or anything, but like thought it'd be kind of cool running around with guns and, you know, <laughs> pretend I was a soldier and do my carpentry. <clears throat> so I applied for that three times, actually, and I was turned down each time because I didn't play sports. And that was the big thing. They were looking for sporty type people, not from a fitness perspective, but for winning medals and trophies. So I guess that kind of spurred me on. And the more I got turned down for it, the more I wanted to do it. <laughs> so the carpentry went to one side and I said, OK, I'm going to join the army. I want, I want to be a soldier, you know? Um, so Ireland, as, as you may or may not be aware, I'm sure you are, there's obviously Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom, and I was in the Republic of Ireland, Southern Ireland. So Southern Ireland has its own, what we call a defence force, uh, uh, Army, Navy and Air Force, Air Corps. Um, and then the British military is the British military, as we know. So I submitted, my, my cousin from Australia was over at the time, so it was a year in, our diff in age difference. And at the time, we used to get the newspapers from the UK in the Republic of Ireland. So the Daily Mirror, the Star, things like that. So it was a UK paper that was just sold in Ireland. So it had nothing really to do with, you know, the socioeconomics that were going on in Ireland, but they would advertise for the British Army at the time. So you could cut out a piece of paper off the newspaper, fill it in, stick it in an envelope, send it away, and they send you back an application pack. And this isn't super unique. I mean, Irish guys have fought in militaries all around the world since Ireland's been Ireland and probably before that. So she said, hey, why don't you apply for the British Army? And I say, Okay, why not? So filled in my details and stuck it in the post. And again, we're going through a very troubled time in Ireland's history. So it was very, very bad. There was ceasefires and ceasefires were breaking. And, uh, you know, when I was growing up, every single day on the news, a police officer or somebody or a soldier or a civilian were being killed in Northern Ireland. Are we talking about late 80s and... Uh, you're talking 80s, 90s, 90s. yes, yeah, mm -hmm. 70s, 80s, 90s. The 70s and 80s, you'd say. Um, but every day. You turn on the news and somebody was up and blown up or shot or, you know, punishment beatings. That was every single day. So it was quite a dark period in, in, in Ireland's time. Um, so you wouldn't really, you wouldn't mention to your neighbors you were thinking to join the British Army. It wasn't a done thing, you know. Uh, and naively, I suppose, as I was, you, you wrote down, it was a free post. You put like a one penny, one pence, one cent, I suppose, equivalent stamp on it and you sent it away. And... They'd write back and it'd have a stamp from the MOD, Ministry of Defence, on it. So the postman always knew who was trying to join the army, you know? And the postman. And that's not good. No, it's the kind of intelligence 101, isn't it, you know? But you know, you're 16, 17 years old, you're not really thinking. Are you? I wasn't anyway. So anyway, I put in and then, you know, they send you down a ticket for the bus and you jump in the bus and yeah, 
go across the border and you go and stay in a little hotel and it's all very sneaky and you go across the road and you do your fitness tests and your interviews and they decide, yeah, well, you move on to the next level. So as you're going through this process, I still, all I wanted to do is be a soldier. I didn't really have a huge amount of, uh, you know, motivation to go one regiment or another. And um, Irish Guards, which would be the guards, you know, the Buckingham Palace, the Queen's Guards, the Irish Guards were a regiment of, of the Foot Guards. So they would have been kind of looking for guys like me from the South, you know, and, you know, tall enough at the time as well. So kind of fitted the bill for that. But it didn't seem to really grab me. And then I seen a, an advertisement for the Parachute Regiment. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, jumping out of airplanes, you know. Um, so I said, yeah, go for that. But the Parachute Regiment is the most hated regiment in the Republic of Ireland. Why? Why? Because we, you've heard of Bloody Sunday. Oh, okay. Right, so one para, late 70s, bit of an issue up there and a couple of people died, you know. To put it mildly, and the regiment got a very bad rapport off the back of it, right? Now, it's not the regiment, it is what it is. It's just something that's, that's carried on with it. So for a Southern Irish guy to go and join a parachute regiment, you're kind of, you know, it's worse and worse and worse, isn't it? And the more I looked into it, and the more I decided I'd, you know, pursue this career, there's additional selection courses you have to go through. So you're going way above the steps that a normal recruit to the military would take. So to, to get to that point, um, interviews, you know, physical tests at different levels, higher than all the other regiments. And then you have to go and do a pre-selection course in the UK before you even start training. Okay. So again, it's an elite force. Um, and then the decision, it was asked me, so why join the Paris? So I suppose I'd made my mind up and said, well, we had a thing where there's a punishment beatings, we call them, they shoot you in the knees, cripple you basically, if they, <laughs> the terrorists get hold of you. So I said, well, if I'm gonna get kneecapped, we call it, I might as well get kneecapped for a reason, you know? So why get kneecapped? Because <laughs> I'm in, you know, some random Irish regiment <laughs> and get kneecapped because I'm a paratrooper. So, okay. So off I went and I joined a parachute regiment <clears throat> and it's about six and a half months of training and there's a selection course, you know, kind of halfway through. Uh, we'd have a huge failure rate, you know, 60, 65%. Um, you know, you'd lose guys in the first day all the way through. And it's a punishing, punishing physical regime, regime you know. The selection course is notorious as well. You know, it's, it's timed events, you know, very, very uh, intensive. Anyway, past selection, served in a battalion. Um, yeah, went to two power uh, and then deployed overseas. And my overseas deployment was back to Northern Ireland. <laughs> so being Southern Irish, you are allowed to opt out, but you know, you're not going to do it, are you? So I served in Northern Ireland during, uh, just before the ceasefire actually broke. And there was a guy, Stephen Restrick was shot by a sniper up there at a checkpoint. They shot him in the back. And that was when the, you know, in around the, the period of time that the ceasefire broke in 1997, excuse me. And um, yeah, that was, that was a bit of a game changer for everything that was going on up there. And the parachute regiment again are kind of elite shock troops. So they said, okay, get the big guns out, get the helmets off, put your berets back on and make it known, make your presence known in, in town, you know? So of course, I was what they called a chat up man. So I'm the guy who talked to the guy in the street and I've obviously got an Irish accent. So as you can imagine, people put one and one together and figured out who I was. And then there was a whole issue after that then for the following year or so where my family started getting a lot of intimidation issues just in general. Um, in the Republic because they lived in the Republic. So it came to a point in, you know, 1998 where I had to make a decision if I was going to stay in the regiment and basically never go home again or, you know, do something different. So I left uh, the British Army and I went back and I joined, at the time I joined the Irish Army, I had opened its, its, you know, its recruitment again. So they didn't take too favorably from a, a British soldier leaving and coming back and joining the, British, the Irish Army. So I went through the whole, again, six months of training, totally different, you know, different tempo from training and professionalism and everything else. You know, they were trying their best, but you know, it was what it was. And I, I, I you know, I knew deep down, I wasn't going to be able to hack this, you know, compared to the Paris. So I kind of taught, played around with the idea of going back to the Paris. And then I was like, you know what? There's a special forces unit here. So I put in my, 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 my pack and I said, okay, I want to go on selection. So trained away for that. I was still extremely fit from, from the Paris. You know, I only did about kind of six, seven months in the regular army, went straight up on selection. And yeah, I mean, there was, there was a whole story behind that where I was, you know, I missed my, my uh, 
interview date, my phys physical uh, examination for a pre-selection because they sent me away, they didn't want me to go. And then I end up doing pre-selection and my interview by myself, <coughs> which isn't a good thing when you're going on selection, <coughs> you know, try and be the gray man, as they say. But yeah, I went up, did selection, and we were probably one of the biggest courses to pass. I think there was nine of us passed out of, there was over a hundred applicants to start off with. But our unit has a notoriously hard selection course. It's, it's kind of changed now and gone online with, with most European and global special forces. That's something that's kind of come out through Afghanistan and Iraq, where they said, you know, for, for continuity training and interoperability, they want guys to be at the same kind of levels and same standards. Um, so, but at the time ours was, you know, it was physical hell, sleep deprivation, so it was, food it was deprivation. really, really bad. Really old you, school, real okay. old school. Yeah, it was real, real. It was just, you know, survival of whoever was left standing type of thing, you know? Um, but yeah, we had a, a pretty decent cohort the guys passed um, and served in the unit. And, you know, we're all still very good friends. One of the very close uh, courses that went through. Um, yeah, and those guys, um, we, you know, we backed up the, the unit and we went and deployed to East Timor then in 99, 2000, uh, when, you know, the Timorese basically looked for their independence. So that was quite an interesting trip. It was a big one for our unit. We went out and we, we were attached in New Zealand SAS <coughs> and we went out into the hills and we operated out there for, you know, as I say, about eight months between the, between the entire time the unit was on the ground. So that was, you know, full on jungle exposure, hmm. you know, old school, just shirts and webbing and boonie hats, no body armor, you know, that type of stuff. So, yeah, we, yeah. We, you know, when you look at what the guys were wearing in Afghanistan and stuff, we were real kind of 1970s, 80s, jungle fighting, you know, webbing, you know, shirt, day, school, day packs, right? real old school, you know, just running, running the minimis. And yeah, it was all, it was all pretty good. It was a really, really interesting trip um, and gave a really good count of ourselves, you know. Uh, spent a couple of years with the unit, went originally to start off, went to what we'd call, you know, air troop. So the free fall and all that type of stuff, because coming from the Paris, it was kind of natural progression for me. Um, and then transitioned across into what we call boat troop, you know, or the maritime team. So obviously dealing with all the boats, the diving, uh, maritime interdiction type of stuff. And that's where I finished my time with the unit. Um, I guess, like I said to you at the start, I, it wasn't like the military. It's, it's always been something that's been, you know, important to me but I, I i take every block of my life like that like a block and when i achieve to where i think i'm you know i've learned enough i kind of transition across move on to the next stage you know so like an old rolling stone you know i don't get, get any moss on me um the really cool thing about the unit was we're, we're it was such a dynamic unit we covered you know the ct blocks we were airborne maritime so everybody was really really adapted being cross-trained into different you know uh where we wouldn't be like a lot of American units, they'd be kind of, I wouldn't say they're one trick ponies, right? but they're very specialized. Our guys, I mean, we, you know, you're, everybody's a medic for starters. Everybody's a, a comms guy, you know, but you'd obviously be far higher qualified in the comms or the medicine than I would. I mean, I was a medic as well, but um, you would be like really, really well drilled in that skill, but you literally can go along and pick up the next guy's job and, and carry that out really, really successful in a team, relatively small teams as well. Uh, huge dynamic and then because of the counter the terrorism threat that we had in Ireland so our counter-terrorism skills were you know you know absolutely exceptional you know and we had the maritime uh, mandate we had the aviation mandate so we were one of the few teams around the world who did a lot of air anti counter aircraft and anti hijacking <laughs> from a military perspective. So a lot of that transition. How, how does that look? And how is this military perspective different from the police perspective? So police have a different mandate, right? And then, so you look at your, your I mean, for, to, to use the American term, the SWAT teams, right? So that's not really, it it's doesn't carry over to Europe, really. You know, so you'd have your, your GSG-9, GIGN, you know, think people like that. Those, they're more of a paramilitary force as well. They're not, you know, your standard police force. So, excuse me, in, in Ireland, we have on Garda Síochána, which is the Irish National Police Force. And their tier one unit is the EOU, the Emergency, Emergency Response Unit. That unit was born from our unit. So guys went across, joined the police and went in, they, were, they stood that unit up. So a lot of the TTPs from there, you know, were kind of brought across into the police and then they looked at the, you know, it's, it's, it's civil power then, isn't it? You know what I mean? So, whereas the military is aid to the civil power. So they have, you know, warrants to effect and different things where we're direct action. We go in, 
you know, you're like a, a Malinois, isn't it? You know what I mean? Go get that guy, take him down. That's what we do, you know? So we work under a different mandate, you know? Um, so going back to your question, you know, what's the difference between police specialist units? You know, they go in, you know, nine times out of 10, probably nine and a half times out of 10 to take the target alive. We go in to neutralize the target and, you know, just make it go away. If we have to take him alive or her alive, whatever, well, then that's a different thing. But not just that, there's different restrictions. And then we deploy overseas, right? So look at a hijacking that takes place, you know, in Tebby in Uganda back in the 80s, whatever, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, or the 70s. And um, the military could deploy and affect that rescue, whereas uh, the police couldn't do that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so police, again, have a national mandate, whereas the military have an international mandate. So that's that. Plus, <clears throat> we would have had, you know, we were born from, you know, that, 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 that upsurge in terrorism in the 70s and 80s, you know, the Olympics and, you know, that's, that's where we grew from. And of course, GSG-9 and, you know, the likes of GIGN and, you know, those units, they, they came from there as well. But they were a paramilitary force, you know, they weren't truly a, a police organized or police force, you know, national police. Um, but of course, that mandate has changed now. And because of, of uh, you know, legalities and everything else, anything that happens on home soil, basically the military, they don't want the military in, in involved because it's not a good, it's not a good, um, it's not a good look to the public if you guys in camouflage uniforms kicking yeah, doors. Yeah, also like um, a lot of national laws and, and constitutions usually prevent that, that from happening. Absolutely. Um, so you said that you kind of have blocks in your life and that uh, one of these blocks was the, the military. Yeah. What did you do after the military? So yeah, so after that then, so this is just prior to the Iraq war. Um, so 9-11 had happened, you know, there was, there was movement, but it was the two main big players, America and the UK. Um, you know, a lot of the other units from around even Europe, they weren't really being engaged in this at the time. You know, if they were, it was on, a, on the periphery supporting operations in Afghanistan, kind of, you know. Um, so there wasn't, it didn't look like there was a whole lot of movement for, for my unit, for example. Um, we, and we would have been focused quite heavily on Africa uh, from a unit perspective, you know, it depends on where you come from and what your national interests and external interests are. It depends where your focus from a unit perspective would be. You know, being Ireland, we didn't have, we had our own terrorism problem. <clears throat> we didn't have to worry about, you know, Al Qaeda because, you know, why are they going to come to Ireland and do anything, you know, or drop airplanes out of the sky. So, you know, from, from a young soldier's perspective where you're, you're at the peak of your military career, you know, there's nowhere else to go. You know, you just had really awesome missions overseas and now you're like, okay, let's go and do exercise and drills and go to the shoot house and get cold and wet and sit in the hills or diving or whatever. You know, it, it kind of wears on you pretty fast. So I could say, I looked at it and I said, okay, I'm going to look at the private sector. Now, the private sector back then looked nothing like the private sector does now. So there was, you know, there was PMCs, but it was, you know, that was... Was the, that the 80s? That was, was that prior to Black Hawk, uh, Black oh, yeah. Uh, Water? Yeah, absolutely. You're talking 2002 okay. era here, you know. Sure. Um, so yeah, I got <clears throat> out and I went and did some civilian work as a diving instructor just to let my hair down, as they say. Um, and then my my old RSM rang me up and he said, "Hey, there's a gig in in Central America. You fancy going?" So I was like, "Yeah, rock and roll. Let's go." So I went to London, did my <laughs> interview. You know, jumped on a plane, flew to uh, Guatemala. And got set up there with a, a, a company that dealt with, you know, ultra high net worth families, Guatemaltecos. So I had to go away and learn Spanish in a month and, you know, come back and look after families. And uh, yeah, so, and that back then you were, that's what happened. You were kind of brought in on, we call it, it's called the circuit, I guess, but it brought in onto the circuit and you kind of got dropped in and you worked with your, you know, the company. And if they liked you, they kind of handed you a family, you know, and then you took that family and those, that family had kids and, nephews and you know whatever else and that's how your contract expanded and then how as that expanded you get a reputation for providing that service you know and then maybe you did something else salvador mexico or whatever and that's how you built your own little empire and how was that transition for you personally like from being you know the military man to yeah basically it was, it a security, was the security sector right this is you know this is something that people ask all the time it's, you know there's no there's no big army behind you there's no support so you're mm. out by yourself Uniquely enough, at the time, there was a huge increase in kidnappings uh, from school kids all the way through to adults in Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras, where we operated. So 
we, my boss, he was pretty, you know, forward thinking and we had like tracking devices that we'd hide into like kids shoes, their school bags, you know, onto their belts, into their little school uniforms and things. And it was nearly a weekly basis. We were going out, you know, with our motorcycle teams, the helicopter flying around with, you know, <laughs> the old TV antenna type of things, um, uh, you know, trying to locate where this kid or this, you know, teenager was. And then we'd affect a, a direct action and we'd go in and kick a door and, you know, get these people back out again. Because you know, like back then, a proof of life was a finger. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it wasn't the pictures. Like they'd chop a hand off and they'd send yeah, it back because I, there was a, a ring on it or something like that. That's, that was proof of life. And thank you, Steve Jobs, for making it easier <laughs> to do a dig digital yeah, yeah. photo. Uh, yeah. But oh, uh, one question, quick question here. Did you did you do uh, like the, the missions where you saved the hostages? Yeah, absolutely. So there was, you couldn't trust the police per se. Uh, okay. So there was, I can't, exactly in, in Guatemala, there was three police forces. There was the national police guys, and the way I can remember, there was guys in the, in the blue shirts, and navy pants and the hats, and they direct traffic and do whatever else, be police officers. Very poorly paid, <clears throat> very corrupt. Then you had the guys in the navy uniforms who were counter narcotics, so like a, a fatigues, you know, uh, with a boonie hat. And then there's the guys in the black, and they were the, counter-terrorism, you know, the SWAT team guys, and they were the Billy Badasses. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I got arrested one night <clears> and I was caught with an illegal pistol and put in the back of a car and I got in the front and I had my legally held pistol and they were driving us to jail and <laughs> like two guys, my buddies in the car following us and, you know, you're going to jail, like, you're in the shit. Illegal gun, you know, and... Uh, yeah, I bribed our way out of it. You know what I mean? I got okay. my, I got my gun <laughs> back. That was basically <laughs> one of the questions I had. You know how, because you had to obtain a, a pistol. Or so a, yeah, so sorry, but I was licensed. I did have a license. But I that was a, just another piece. Yeah, we, you know, and guys, we'd have guys come in and out. We'd have yeah, some you know, side off, pistols. We had M4s and AKs and hand grenades and whatever <laughs> else. I mean, we did. You know, we actually, I don't know if you remember the old M Tech system. From many many years ago no. it was a, it's basically an upper receiver and you'd put your glock 17 lower into it oh, right? so. Yeah. so the m tech was the first we brought them in from the u we used to fly up and buy m techs and put them in our luggage and bring them down and um, but it wasn't like the roni where you could pop your pistol mm. out instead of a pistol you, you know you'd have to carry your Low slide tech, but still effective Low tech effective it gave us a long gun and then you know <laughs> Uh, mm. And so our viewers understand then with our viewers, I mean me. Um, <laughs> so it, you were basically working for one family, but you had like, let's say a group of people working together for multiple companies or... Well, it was one company and they had multiple clients, you ah, know, okay. so families, politicians, everything else. And so when <laughs> I was saying one family, you, I would be kind of sold, you know, you're looking after yeah. Jose's family. Yeah. You know, and Jose is okay and he's got his wife and they have the cousins and, you know, that's the primary, my primary client I get who I would look after. But when she hits the fence, you guys yeah, we all together. we all fall yeah. back in and go, well, Jose's sister's after been kidnapped or the kid's after yeah. been lifted from school. The viewers now understand. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we'd, we'd, we'd go out and we'd triangulate, you know, we had a helicopter and, you know, we'd fly around and literally with the old style TV antennas and triangulate with the guys on motorbikes and Jeeps. And we go, right, they're in this on You literally had hours to get this done. Triangulate, find where they are, you know, get the guys in, stack up and, you know, go in and. So old school. Old school, um, yeah, proper, you know, <laughs> very check, nice. check shirts and no, no body armor, you know, you know. And, and not legal, kind of, <laughs> yeah. very grayish area, yeah, right? Very, yeah. I mean, hey, it's just a long time ago. Yeah, it was. So, so are there any like, interesting steps between this and how did you come to Blackwater? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty interesting one. So, yeah, so I was in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and I, I came home and I was uh, with my girlfriend who's Spanish. She was living in, 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 in my house in Ireland. And yeah, I was kind of tired of being away, took some time off. I'm sitting on my sofa. And my phone rings at like 10 o'clock at night. And I was like, hey, you got your resume, your CV here. And I'm like, okay. I don't remember sending my CV to anybody. <laughs> okay. You go with it. And he goes, you want to go to Iraq? There's a war started. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so, and I had a friend of mine who I had actually met randomly as it is in East Timor. On Anzac Day, we were sent, I was sent down. So quite a few years before that. Uh, as a representative of the Irish Special Forces guys, and there was no alcohol, so we were drinking tea around a cooler. And I met this guy, and uh, Shane, and um, 
yeah, he uh, told me, we literally drank tea for that evening. I said, hey, if you're ever in Ireland, you know, hit me up. A couple of years later, I'm in Ireland, my phone rings. He goes, hey, I'm the guy from Timor. And I'm like, who is this dude? Picked him up, met him, drank some beers, figured out who he was after about an hour and a half. And I was like, holy shit, it is you. Yeah, I remember now because it was like one, one chance encounter. We stay friends to this day. And then when <clears throat> when I was out in uh, uh, Central America, a position came up to take over the uh, El Salvador office. Salvador office. And I called him and I said, hey, you want a gig? He said, yeah, let's go. So I brought him out there. So <clears throat> he, at the same time, had come back to Ireland. He was sitting on the sofa in my living room across me. And I said, hey, I'll go. But I kind of bring somebody with me. And they were like, yeah, the more the merrier. We're, we're looking for guys. So I said to Shane, hey, you want to go to Iraq? And he's like, when? I was like, well, we're fine in two days. He's like, Phew. Get it done. <laughs> so anyway, we go over into Kuwait, if I remember. No, it was, it was Jordan. And uh, loaded up, it was all, you know, literally the war was just in its in its its waning days. It was finishing up. So yeah, onto a C-130 and no body armor, no nothing. And we're sitting on the old, uh, the red seats in C-130. We're flying in, there's news reporters everywhere else. <clears throat> the uh, crew chief comes down and he's like, hey, lock it in, we're going in. So I don't know how they, if you know how they land a C-130 in a, into a war zone, they corkscrew it. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah it's, it's corkscrew, that's what it's called. So if you haven't done it before, we would have done it. I mean, the military puts the shits up people, basically, you know. <laughs> and I saw lights out, and then they come in, really short landing. Mm, Doors mm. come down, get off the plane. Stuff goes on the plane, you run off onto the runway, they load up what wounded, whatever they have to get up. Plane takes off, and it goes. So it's kind of, if, if you haven't done it before, you know, for us, we find it quite amusing. But yeah, so we land on the, on the, on, in Baghdad, blistering hot. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this, the, the team that's on the ground to receive us are there. They have a, a minivan, they open it up and there's old AK-47s in the back with no buttstocks. <laughs> okay, you know, not what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And one it's magazine. <laughs> and there's a, there's a guy and a, and a girl there, quite heavy sicker, and she's got an MP5 and a tie holster and her Glock and a black t-shirt and he's the same. And they're like, right, we're here to bring you in to a, it's the Palestine Hotel is where we were staying, which funnily enough got rocketed a couple of nights later. But anyway, they're like, yeah, so jump in the car and we, the van and we go in. And you know, before you go anywhere, you do a little bit of due diligence and a bit of a map recce and stuff. And I was like, well, we got to drive down the Bayap Road and you know, it's a couple of Ks into the city. We're going, you know, through some dangerous areas. So. I said, hey, what are actions on? They're like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, very blasé. So I looked around to this group of guys and I was like, this is bullshit, <clears throat> right? Actions on are, if this happens, this is what we're going to do. Kind of how to take ownership of the situation, you know, because that's how people die, isn't it? We drove yeah, in. That, that, that's, but that's a really good lesson. I think a lot of people now in modern world forget about this, but like they kind of rely yeah. on others and told, the organization yeah. and <clears throat> I don't know, like police and security services. But you, you have to come to a point that when you realize that you are kind of responsible for yourself because that's, that's it's if, hugely important. You're yeah. responsible for, you know, there's nobody going to bring you home other than you. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what it is, you know, and I mean, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but <clears throat> it, that was that. I mean, and, you know, I hate the whole the sheep following the sheep scenario. You know, that's what kills people. And here we are surrounded by, you know, a group of whatever it was, seven or eight of us, all ex-military, supposedly, you know, probably, I don't know who was more high speed than who else, but whatever. I knew my background and, you know, I, we asked a question. Red flag had come up because we had shitty AKs. No buttstock. I don't know if you ever tried to fire an AK-47 with no buttstock. It's not particularly, you know, it didn't know if I they did. worked. It's hard. Didn't know if they work, you know. What was the function check? They were literally just throwing on top of each other in the back of the car and one magazine. So... Yeah, we did that. We got in. We did actually get ambushed on the way in, you know, as was par for the course. And um, got into the hotel, you know, stayed with that company then for a little while, um, you know, a couple of months. And it was just gradually got worse and worse, the kit and equipment, trying to get ammunition. I had a Tariq pistol issued to me, which is an Iraqi knockoff of a Beretta 92 and a really bad knockoff, you know. <coughs> uh, the guys in Pakistan make better ones in the garage. Um, and it was so bad, we used to try and, well, you'd try and make friends with the Americans because they had everything. And you'd use your credentials as being who you were. And we used to do shooting competitions. So when they go out in a raid, they'd bring back weapons. And we'd be like, hey, what do we got to do to get these off? You know, you could buy stuff as well, but you know, you're tight ass, so try and blag it, you know. Um, and I remember doing a, doing a pistol competition on the range one day. 
and draw my pistol and bring it up and the slide had stayed in my holster, <laughs> <laughs> right? And the guy, you know, he's like, with his 45 and he's like, yeah, yeah, I won. And I was like, yeah, oh shit. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, wow. All right, come on, you need to come to the container, you know? So he's like, felt sorry for us. But yeah, so we in Baghdad run around a place. I mean, you know, it's a whole other story in itself doing kind of crazy, very cowboy missions. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of organization. It was companies coming in, grabbing what they could contract wise and manning them with really poor equipment. So it was all kind of self-procured. You know, you had good body armor, you bought it yourself. You had, like nobody had helmets, nobody wore helmets or anything like that. But you know, weapon systems, we'd buy our own weapon systems or blag them off teams or whatever. Ammunition the same. So know. in the, sorry, in the organization, it was a difference if you were international or American? Company, yeah. So the American companies uh, had, now, Blackwater was still kind of, I won't say a non-entity, but it wasn't, still wasn't that well known. So everybody knew them. And they were kind of those guys down there, you know, who had helicopters, mm -hmm. whatever else. And then there was a couple of UK companies coming in. And there was a couple of companies who had no place being there, who actually turned into international security companies. But at the start, it was completely making it up as you go along. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, really... You know, I won't drop names, but yeah. But I heard that a lot of <coughs> these kind of contracts were won by companies that were not even companies yet. They created a company just to well, win one, one company. That company I worked for was actually uh, an Australian-based company, and they were working on a contract. And the company had the contract, lost the contract. But the guys, the clients, liked two of the guys, and they said, "Hey, if you guys had a company." we give you the contract. Mm -hmm. And one of those guys, his brother or something, had a security company back in Australia who did door work. They said, well, actually we have a security company. Okay, you got the contract. There's a $30 million contract. You know, it was, that's how things happen. These guys are there and there's the old company have all their weapon systems that they've accumulated. And they're like, well, you're not getting any of these. We've lost a contract. So yeah, you're, they're left with whatever they could pick up, you know? Um, and we're the ones that had to carry that stuff. And the vehicles were the same, fuel, accommodation, all this type of stuff. So it, it was pretty, pretty lax how things were done. <clears throat> um, I was then asked to go down to a place called Anna Jaff, which is South Central Iraq, uh, early 2004. And I was down there a couple of weeks. And you have to remember back then as well, like the Iraqi people, they didn't mind us. You could walk around and, you know, there was nobody trying to kill you all the time. You know, you would get ambushed every now and again, but it wasn't like it became... You know, mm. generally they were like, oh, great. You know, we've, we're free. We've got our independence. We can buy cars and do whatever we want to do. That situation changed dramatically, obviously. And one of the main things behind that was the Mahdi army. That was uh, led by a guy called, uh, still is led by a guy called Muqtada al-Sadar. Okay. And I don't know if you remember uh, in Fallujah in 2004, the Blackwater team that got rolled up and they got hung out of the bridge and their bodies burnt and all that. So that happened in, I think, February 2004. I was in Anajaf, so Anajaf al Hilla, uh, that area down there. Um, and the situation just after that killing, like the, the, the entire uh, vibe in the place started to change. You could feel it, you know? Mm. And we all start obviously getting aware, you know, because you don't get hung out of a bridge, do we? Um, so we were down there, and yeah, it was the. Uh, the 4th of the 4th, 2004, I'll never forget <laughs> it. I got up in the morning, we had, we had a three-man team. And it was myself, and the, the team leader was an ex-Aussie SES guy, and me, I was me, 2IC, and then there was the other guy, who's uh, Manny, good friend of mine, uh, ex-Australian commandos. So we were there and we had like 12 or 13 clients, and we, um, yeah, we, we on the ground, and I just had a weird vibe that morning. That week, you know, and we had kind of, we were living in the city, so we had two villas that were kind of backed onto each other. We knocked the walls through so we could move from one street to the other in case we had to egress. Um, but again, that vibe was just changing. So we had got a load of 55 gallon drums and we'd fill them and put chicanes and borders. And I'd hired a load of local guys and got AKs from them and kind of controlled our little, dominated our part of the street. Um, and the fort, yeah, I got up in the morning and it was just, just a weird, weird vibe, you know? And I went up, I remember going up onto the roof and looking around and going, there's something not right. So I went downstairs. I said to the guys, I said, hey, something not right in the city, you know? And the team leader was an idiot. 
was like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. They love us. You know, we're here to help them. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm not so sure. I've been in these situations before. So I said to Manny and I said, hey, buddy, what's happening? He said, let's go. Let's jump in the car and drive. So we drove and we went off the back streets. We were up onto the main street in front of the, 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 the CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority, which was the, the camp, which was a, a university campus that was never finished right beside the hospital. And that street was just thronging with people. There was thousands of people on it. You know, and as we drive around the corner, they get RPGs over the shoulders and PKMs and AK-47s. And we're like, All right, OK, this is going south fast. So we drive around and uh, we're wearing, you know, the uh, the white man dresses, we call them, shemags in our heads. We had beards and stuff. And I'm sitting in the car and they look straight at us. Now, Manny would be slightly darker than I was. And not that it really matters, but I mean, he would maybe blend in a little bit more. And I had... A shitty AK that I used to carry. It was a good one, but it had no butt stock on just in the front of the car. And I just held the AK out the window and screamed Al Akbar. <laughs> let off 30 rounds into the air. And they were like, oh, awesome. Yeah, go, <laughs> you know. So we knew there and then, you know, we got to get out of here. So the only place to go was towards the camp. So we drive towards the back gate of the camp and the El Salvadorians had the camp, the back of the camp. And it was the, um, the Spanish controlled the front part of the camp, which where the attack was starting to take place. So it was unfolding. So we drive up anyway, and a Black Hawk gunship flies over us with the, the minigun out the door. And I'm like, oh, we're going to get somebody, some, we're getting dead today. You know, if those guys don't kill us, these guys are going to kill us. The Salvador is <coughs> going to kill us. You know, we're driving a little sedan. So we get up to the back gate, and they're screaming at us in loud hailers and pointing dish get our uh, 50 cals at us and M60s and a whole lot. So we get out, strip off all our stuff, and I'm screaming at them in Spanish, you know, it's okay, we're here, we're contractors, there's our DOD badges, blah, blah, blah. So they're like, okay, come in, come in. And they're like, you guys are crazy. What are you doing out there? We're like, well, What's happening? They're like, you know, there's an uprising. I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. Yeah, no, you told me. Yeah, I was just didn't even have my cereal this morning, you know? <laughs> so we drive in. You're like, you crazy bastard. So, oh, well, you're safe now. And we're like, yeah, okay, but everybody's still in the city, all our mm. clients and one of our guys. So we jump in the car and the camp was split in two with a road down the middle with just berms, yeah. right? And uh, we jump in the car and I drive down to the CPA side where the Spanish side is, and that's where the Blackwater team were, you know? And, you know, we'd built a rapport with them trying to get ammunition on them. You're always trying to flag stuff. Like, it's just like being in the military. You're always trying to get free stuff off people. And they had all the good stuff. So we kind of knew them and rocked down there. And then there's this bit of a living legend, Chris White, white boy. And he's ex, uh, you know, team six guy. He was the team leader of the team. And he walks in, he goes, ah, Irish. He goes, how are you? You're alive. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, Cool. He goes, well, you're going to stay with us? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to, but, you know, our clients are out in the city. And he's like, oh, it's tough for them, but at least you guys are okay. You know, you know, what was the story? And I said, well, we came in and this is what we've seen. So they had a bit more intel. And then, yeah, he's like, so what are you doing now? And I said, well, we're going back out to try and get them and come back in again. He's like, yeah, we, we're not going to see you again. You know, he goes, you know, hats off to you guys, but, you know, that's the stupidest thing I've heard all day. And then there was a Spanish, um, I like to call him a general, I don't know what he was, for the Spanish contingent. You have to remember just before that, the Madrid bombings had taken place. So the Spanish government were in negotiations with the Mahdi army not to engage them because they had armor and they had, you know, heavier weapon systems down there. And they were supposed to be controlling that. But they were like, you know, oh, we'll go out into the city and get them. And like, if you go out there, you're going to get destroyed. It's just not going to happen. We're better going our little car. So we jumped in the car, myself and Manny drove back up out the back gate, back into the team house, how we got through the crowds, I don't know, and went in and said, right, load up, we're going, grab all your shit, we're going. Nobody sure. believed us. Into the car, I said, well, you're coming with us, you're staying behind. It's as simple as, I'm not staying here because they're going to kill, they're going to tie me out of a bridge or of a house and, you know, you're not paying me enough for that. Get everybody into the vehicles, drove them down to uh, that junction again, and then we drove up into the junction, myself and Manny, to draw fire while the rest of the team went across. <laughs> To the back gate and then we eventually a little bit of firefight got back out up to the back gate dropped everybody off a little bit of firefight yeah, yeah just yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> working uh, <laughs> i can by the way this and that like i i really like your flow because <laughs> a little bit of firefight just <laughs> teeny one uh so we got in and got in through the salvadorians and everything else and they gave us accommodation <clears throat> and so i said okay you know just the fighting is on at the main the main camp that's where it is and that's where they need we need shooters down there you know, and I had told the guys from BW, I said, look, if we make it back, we're coming to see you. We come and help you, you know, because they're just a team, you know, and they were doing all the fighting. 
So I said to the guys, my clients, and I, we, you know, we, over the last couple of weeks, we had you know a rapport with them and everything else. And a couple of them were ex-Vietnam vets, and I said, guys, you know, if I get you a couple of weapon systems, are you happy to hold on to them? They're like, Fuck yeah, I'll run a gun, you know. So I went over and I found a letter, would you believe, last year was going through my files, and I signed out like a couple of crates of 50 cal ammunition, a box of grenades, a couple of 66s, a couple of AT4s like six or seven AK-47s, a couple of thousand rounds of ammunition. I found that letter where I signed for it. And I remember laughing to myself, signing for this, this <laughs> store man from the Salvadorians <clears throat> in the shipping container. I'm going, I'm going to use all this shit. Mm. You know, you're not getting anything back. But anyway, came in and we call it TOETs, you know, uh, that's an elementary training. So it's just uh, for the weapon systems. So yeah, went through everything, the AKs, I remember how to use this, yeah. My team leader was like, well, I'm not going down there. Somebody has to stay with the clients. But he these people are in the safest possible place they can be. They have the whole Salvadorian company around them. They can protect them. I said, if we're going to be overrun, which is what it was looking like at the time, it's going to happen on the main, at the main CPA building because they wanted the uh, American, he, he's not an ambassador, but kind of Benghazi style situation mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, was down there. Mm -hmm. um, so the guy that, down, that was down there at the time, Phil Cosnet, he was kind of Paul Bremer's, you know, one of Paul Bremer's right hand, ma hand men. So a very, very important guy in, in the politics that were going on in Iraq at the time. Hence the reason you had a Blackwater team protecting them. So we said our farewells and, you know, good luck and see if we see, if we don't, you know, see in Valhalla. Jumped in the car and off we drove down and white boy was standing at the door shaking his head. He's seen us, you know, speeding around the corner a little in our little, uh, <laughs> in our little suburban. And he's like, you guys made it? I'm like, yeah. So where do you want us? And he's like, hit the roof. And that was it up there. And we fought up on the roof then for days but four days and we took Fuck. yeah three wounded that day and um, one of the guys salvadorian guy got a uh, loss his bottom part of his jaw got shot in the jaw and uh, marine got shot in the shoulder and then um what's the other one? Oh yeah the, the, the captain who i took his m16 uh, he got shot in the chest actually so <clears throat> but yeah we fought up there pretty hard for a couple of days and that night we'd go out and it was pretty it was pretty fucked up actually because where we were in the cpa building overlooking there was like a, a roundabout bunker from when you would have driven in off the road and that was had salvadorian guys down there and it was so bad it was being overrun and we were dropping two or trees down on top of the bunker you know that's that's how close they were in the wire when i say you know in the wire they were in the wire and we'd go out then in the evenings and we'd go through the bodies and take ak ammo and stuff out them so was and this was this happening at the same time where um that famous footage was done of um that's us man it's the black water and the jaff. That's that's us. I had the spiky hair. <laughs> so, nice. I've been on TV before. You know? <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so that that's that's the famous black water and the jaff battle. But yeah. also, uh, I think w the footage that I'm also referring to is the one where uh, I think U.S. Marines were supplied by Blackwater helicopters. Yeah, that was that was our helicopter. So uh -huh. yeah, I mean, I took the picture to looking up at the at the at the little bird, the guy kicking the, the crate off. So awesome. yeah, that was um, they we couldn't get a medivac in. So the US military wouldn't fly in. It was deemed to be too hot. So Blackwater decided they dropped down tools and they, whoever was available, jumped in, loaded ammunition and, you know, weapon systems and flew up. And then they were the ones who evacuated the wounded down to the cache hmm. down in Baghdad. So legit, yeah. And all those pilots and those guys were awesome. Pilots were, for the majority, all TF-160 guys. So US Special Forces pilots. Had, a lot of them had fought in Mogadishu, Black Hawk Down type of thing. So, hmm. you know, they weren't, they weren't playing around. You guys flew with a, an M4 and MP5 across their lap, you know, <laughs> pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, we, we fought down there for a couple of days. Well, about four days straight. Uh, and then, you know, that day actually, when, when the guy got shot in the jaw, I figured out that they were shooting at us from the hospital, which was overlooking us. That was the highest point in the city. So yeah, I was the one to initiate the contact on that. And then the following day, we went across and we cleared a hospital, that team, I have a pretty cool picture of that where I stood outside the hospital with the flags and we cleared that hospital top to bottom, just that, that Blackwater team and secured that and then posted security, whatever else. But uh, there was a couple of cool pictures there. Actually, they used the, uh, the teacher, the doctor training academy and they had all, you know, the green chalkboards and they mm -hmm. had all their orders written on it and they had pictures like little stick pictures of us on the roof and me with my spiky <laughs> hair. And there was another guy, one of my friends, Noah, had spiky hair as well and we had hair. And they could see on the roof, oh, there's a guy with spiky hair over there, a guy with a big gun over there, rockets, you know, and that was their little orders. So they were well organized, you know. Um, yeah, and that was Najaf. Uh, we, that team, yeah, they basically said, hey, what's, you know, 
a week and a half later, you know, you want to come and work for Blackwater? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, you guys got really nice guns and nice clothes. And, you know, we had nothing. We, we had E&E out of, the, out of, out of the, the team house. So we jumped, myself and Manny, obviously, um, jumped on a, a, on a Polish helicopter, I remember, um, up the other end of the camp, and we were to fly back to Baghdad. And I remember sitting there, and we had our, our long guns, whatever, and it was pretty full. And it was one of the smaller uh, choppers. And anyway, it spins up, dust everywhere. We take off and, you know, we're in the air. We're thinking, oh, good stuff, you know. And then, yeah, four or five minutes later, the chopper is landing again. And that's not the trip to Baghdad. And the crew chief was like, you know, you know we're too heavy. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I look at Manny and I'm like, well, I kind of like it here. We jump, we jump off, you know. So off we jump and we, you know, as you do, it's dust. So we take our position and we realize we're about a cane and a half outside the wire. Right, so they literally just landed, kicked the two contractors with guns off, and we're out and we're like, "Oh, this is a really, really bad place to be." So off we go, and of course, all the other guys on the wire are looking, kind of going, "What's after happening?" Now there's two guys, you know, patrolling in with Bergens on and AKs patrolling up to the gate, and hey, guys, you know, can we come back in again? So eventually, got back up to Baghdad, went to see our old company, and they fired us. Oh, you know, you abandoned your clients, and you did this and that, and, blah, blah, blah. and they kicked us out into the red zone which is outside the green zone, obviously, with our backpacks on. So we're walking, walking down the streets of Baghdad going, yeah, fucking hell, looking tourists. for a living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, it was, it was bizarre. I mean, that's, yeah. But here, if I can stop you, <laughs> like, so obviously military life is not for everybody. No. Um, and you, I, you I kinda, have to. I seem, it seems that you are enjoying that. Like, yeah, because you have to be a special type of. <laughs> stupid shit. No, no, it's not stupid. <laughs> Just like you. I know that when you are there in action, you're not like, woohoo, let's go. I know that this is like fun times not fun times but just you know memories and you know it, 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 and i guess you look at yourself i, I had a full life kind of thing yeah. right i know that <clears throat> when you're there it's not like that but definitely it seems like you know you are a type of uh, <laughs> the guy that belonged in the military a, a real sticker <laughs> yeah but i mean one, yeah i mean <laughs> i guess you know like i said i <sighs> but this is you know you can see this, I don't know, in movies, you can read it in a book, but what were your emotions in, in, in those four days? Are, is that like... Well, for example, uh, you know, I suppose maybe the perfect way to answer this, I, I that morning before we, we went and left the camp, you know, in the, or the, the team house in the Jaff to go into the camp, I uh, told you I had my girlfriend at the time who I was lying to every time there was a rocket or explosion, I was telling her it was somewhere else to try and keep her calm. Piñada. Yeah. Uh, and my brother and, you know, my family in general. So I, I rang my girlfriend at the time, now wife, and I said, hey, you know, it's all fine. Now, I, in my head, had decided I was dead. Mm -hmm. You know, I was on the sat phone and I was like, yeah, look, this is, it's all good. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? I'd just driven through and been in a small little firefight and stuck 30 rounds in the air and she screamed out like bar and, you know, nearly got shot by a gunship and nearly got lit up by a 50 cal <laughs> going in the back gate and then, you know, got laughed at by the guys in Blackwater and drove all the way back through it again. So I was on the sat phone going, yeah, no, it's all good. You know, don't worry about it. Okay. And I suppose it was only afterwards I kind of thought about that. And then I rang my mom and I was like, hey, mom, same thing. All fine. You know, it's all cool. Then I rang my brother and I was like, hey, man, I'm fucking not getting out of this. <laughs> you know, I was just not, this is fucking NX. I'm, I'm done. So you tell your brother everything. And I'm like, hey, man, look, and there's nothing coming back in a box, right? I'm going to be fucking fried chicken here there's nothing coming back if you even get like don't don't pay for repatriation there's nothing going to come back and nothing worth bringing back he's like oh okay he was a soldier too um so we got it he was kind of he was still serving at the time he's like okay he goes like it's that bad and i was like it's it's a shit show that time's fucking 500 bad and he goes well okay is there anything you can do and i was like look i'm gonna work the problem you know i'm gonna work it Trust me, I don't want to die, but I'm going to fucking kill as many of these motherfuckers as I can on the way out, you know? But don't expect, don't do proof for lives because that's what they were doing. They were taking people. This is before the whole orange jumpsuit thing, but they, mm -hmm. were, they were doing similar to that at the time. And I had said to him, like, this is, you know, if you don't hear from me in two days, it's, consider yeah, me dead. Over. You know, sorry, there's me details. The will is in such and such a place, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I mean... Mentally in my head, then I made that switch, and I was like, it wasn't that. It's like the like the, you know, the fear level goes down or anything. But then it's like you're, it's like stacking up to go into a room or you know, take down. Can I, can I think you, if 
I understand correctly, you kind of <laughs> solve all the other problems by work telling your problem, brother, man. yeah, yeah, exactly. well, you so work the problem. I mean, you, like that's me. I've, I've, I've. Kind of so I've said goodbye to my wife or my girlfriend. Yeah, she doesn't know, but she I doesn't did know, it. but I've yeah, done yeah, it. I did you know? it for myself, and she'll yeah. remember that. Mm. You know, she'll go. At least I got to speak to her again. Mm. You know, mm. same with my mom. And then my brother, you know, just she's straight and honest. That's it's it's you know, got to give him how how I think it's going to go down because, like I say, two weeks before they tied a load of guys out of a bridge and burnt them to death and dragged them through the streets. You know, that was, and then we had driven through. You know, a shit fight didn't get too bad. We were driven through a shit fight already. Um, so, yeah, at that stage, then it's what are my problems and how am I going to mitigate the risk and the problems and get back to where I need to be? So I guess that's, you know, and, you know, having had the career I had in the military, in the units I had served in, it had set me up for that. So it was, you know, work the problem, work the problem. There's the problem. Find an issue or find a way to resolve it, you know, whatever way it needs to be done. If that answers your question. Yeah. No, it wasn't. But yeah, I can see that. I, basically, my question was about the switch, right? Uh, the emotions, um, because it's not normal to be just like, yeah, let's go. But yeah. <laughs> and I don't I hope it doesn't come across like that because it wasn't. I mean, no, no, obviously, no. I was thinking, fuck, you know. No, you, you are such a good storyteller. You know, I think you should write a book, by the way. <laughs> but you're really such a, you know, very good storyteller. And you don't even... You can't even, Im you can imagine the shit show, but not through emotion, just mm. by facts you're telling. So that's why I had to pause you for emotions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we continue, should we do a quick pause? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so <laughs> then you came to Blackwater. So yeah, I was in Blackwater and we, um, that team that was in uh, and the Jaff then became kind of superstars in Blackwater because it was, you know, we... Did Benghazi the right way around, I guess, before Benghazi happened, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. we, we held off the Mahdi army and, you know, cleared hospitals and did what we had to do and, you know, held the camp, basically. We didn't get overrun. And this is facing insurmountable odds. I mean, there was thousands of people, you know? Um, and they had the city. You know, there was no big army, there was no support. I mean, okay, we got Spectre in on station, you know, the, uh, the gunship. Mm -hmm. But Spectre in on station, we had a, an SF team actually fought their way into us and you know gave us some calm so we could we could talk to the, to the fast movers and the choppers uh from from the green side um but yeah i mean we were you know i mean everybody on that team was tier one you know uh, and then uniquely enough i became the 2ic so yeah but that team then we stayed together for quite a few years after that working work in different locations uh, and then kind of training as well because this then could become a reality for other teams in remote stations, you're, you know, your Maddies, your your UNES, whatever locations. So they wanted us to go out and kind of, you know, this is what we did. I'm not saying it's what's going to work here, but you know, pass that information. Um, I had a really, really good time, yeah. And then you know, uh, a lot of lessons learned from it, and yeah, number number of contracts with that team. And then, sorry. One question, just quickly. Uh, when you came to Blackwater, like, there was not a lot of... There was, I think, at the time, I was probably the second non-American. Non-American. Uh, there was, so I was like number three, but one of the guys uh, before me was ex-British military. I think he was an ex-paratrooper, actually. But he had US citizenship. So, so he I doesn't was, count. Technically, doesn't no, count. because he was, he was US, <laughs> you know, but yeah. So I think I was the second non-American to be picked up and literally it was what it was. And then Manny, my buddy, the Australian, he actually had dual nationality as well, but he was technically the, the third or fourth guy. Um, and then, you know, more guys came online, non-Americans, non but at that stage in, in the war, in the, you know, I guess the war, um, there was very, very few non-Americans, you know, probably in around that time, I think they looked around and they said, hey, we need guys to do fill various roles. And there was a lot of picking guys up in country. So there was a lot of actually what we call contract jumping. So you'd be out with a contract and Blackwater paid really well as well at the time. And the kit and equipment was, you know, brand new. You know, you got a Peli case full of brand new 511 gear and, you know, Black Hawk body armor and you know, helmets and a brand new M4 and a brand new Glock, you know, Black Hawk holsters and, you know, everything was brand new. It was like being issued stuff in the teams. And the vehicles were really good. 
had our own helicopters, you know, come on, it was, you know, private, it was a private military, you know, basically. Uh, you know, you wanted to go to the range, you went to the range, you got paid well, you know, you always got your flights in and out, there was never any mess and you stayed in a nice hotel in Jordan on the way in and the way out. So it was just all in all, it was really, you know, a well-run organization. Um, had a really good team house, yeah. And now Blackwater kind of had, had the state teams, so the state department, which was a much bigger contract for them. And we were kind of on the other side of the house. We were kind of more the higher tier guys that ran around kind of troubleshooting stuff, you know, and maybe wouldn't have fitted in on the state contracts, you know? So it was two very distinctive sides to Blackwater at that time. You know, you had a, a, a Bremer's detail, you know, uh, really, really squared away cats on that. They were kind of the originals that had kind of come in around the Afghanistan time and brought on board, you know. Um, still like legends in their own right, a couple of good books out there. Um, and then we would have kind of been the the growth of that, you know, that that those teams with Chris and guys like that, K2, really good dudes. Um, and then there was, you know, the state side of stuff. They had the Humvees and the 50 Cals and that's where the helicopters were for. They were supposed to support the state department contracts, you know. Um, yes, yeah, so we ran around doing that for, like nearly a year or so and then I was home on leave uh, in between contracts actually and uh, I was just I think I'd actually signed a contract and sent it back and my my boss my TL Chris he said hey have you signed that contract yet and I was like yep and he said well tell him you don't want to do it you're coming on to another gig with me I said, okay cool where are we going he goes oh we're going to this company just fill in these details this guy will email you okay fine so next thing I know, I, I, I land up uh, with a company called USIS, United States Investigation Services. And that they had the contract, without getting into too much, to train Iraqi Special Forces. And <laughs> funnily enough, it was at Baghdad Airport on the back road. And there was two camps. There was one camp run by the Green Berets, training the Army Special Forces. And we trained the police, paramilitary Special Forces. It's kind of side by side. And it was the government training one, and then they, I don't know whether it was, they looked at it and said, look, can we privatize this training or do we have to use the Green Berets to do it? Whatever. Anyway, USIS had the contract and it was a ground up contract. So literally took the camp, took a piece of land, built it up. I think there was six ranges on it, two kill houses, a long gun range, all inside the walls of the camp, driving track, you know, chow halls, everything else, stores, and people were hired for their jobs, you know? So the storeman was a storeman. So he was a senior store man in the Navy, whatever, and he had to, that was his job, go in and run the stores. So he ran that. The people who worked in the stores were storemen. The guys who ran the med center were doctors and paramedics and, you know, combat types. And the instructors were all former tier one guys. So it was very well financed, well funded and well supported. We had everything. You know, again, when I say Blackwater had some good stuff, this company had everything. So we went on and a quick question here before we go too far. Um, what's your thought about like using Green Berets to train special forces uh, compared to outsourcing it to a private company? I mean, Green Berets, you know, that's their, their kind of mantra. That's what they do. They, you know, go back through Vietnam times and, you know, that's their bread and butter. That's what they're kind of, you know, taking local national local forces and putting them into a, you know, a, a ad hoc military group and, you know, providing support to coalition forces wherever they do. And that's why they're linguists and, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're not tier one guys, they're awesome dudes, but they're, you know, they're not, they're, their real task isn't stacking up on an aircraft, you know, they can do it, I'm sure. But I mean, that's their role is to develop national, local content, bring it up, you know, develop the networks. I mean, that's the whole concept behind, you know, the Green Berets. So yeah, absolutely the right guys to do that. You know, long-term operations out in the bush and the desert or the jungle, whatever happens to be, develop those, those, build that institution. You know, and look at Vietnam, for example. You know, that's exactly mm -hmm. what they did. You know, replicate that across to the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan, all the way through to you know who they tried to do it with the uh, with the um, in Iraq. Again, Iraq was you know they were bit trying to, in my opinion, the biggest mistake they made was kind of demobbing the military and the police, and then kind of trying to restart it again because. You know, just like a refugee crisis, you tore your passport up and you can be anybody, you know. So we had the same issue. That's why all these organizations were so heavily infiltrated by the Mahdi Army and, you know, different organized crime groups, as well as, you know, organizations where we were classed as terrorists. So I think the, the Green Berets were absolutely the right people to do that, you know. Um, 
and I think, yeah, we were the right people to do the, the police element because, you know, you can't really take guys in a SWAT team from, you know, Carolina and bring them over and then have them train because it's a different, it's a different type of war, you mm -hmm. know? It's, so you're, I think, use the private sector, the experience that guys like us have, bring them in, train up the police. Now we had police guys, former police guys with us. So, you know, they would teach the law and the different rules and regulations that, that wasn't us. We were training them how to, you know, mechanical breach, explosive breach, long range shooting, you know, ingress, egress off aircraft, boats, whatever else. And, uh, you know, just doing direct action tasks, taking down, you know, bomb makers or terror cells, whatever else. And yeah, yeah so that's what we did. We had to actually go and find the guys. So we used to go to the uh, police academy and uh, the different police stations and run little fitness tests and put them on buses and then bring them back to the camp. And the camp was called Camp Dublin. <laughs> so yeah, and then we'd run them through. Now when I say a selection course, you know, a selection course. Um, and yeah, those who passed a kind of weak selection, we put through on, onto to a blocks of training from, you know, firearms and, you know, just the discipline side of stuff all the way through. I made some, some really good door kickers out of them, yeah. Uh, did, oh, yeah, did, did you have any um, kind of concerns that um, terrorists could infiltrate those ranks or? Like, yeah, I mean, it's always going to be a concern, you know what I mean? Or like, or like some of the trainees would like turn against you, just like turn around and- We didn't have, you. so you're kind of referring to Afghanistan, that type of thing. we didn't really have that, you know, because we did do a pretty good vetting and just by nature of what we were doing, you know, we weren't overly concerned about numbers. You know, we wanted to get guys through, but we didn't need to have a class of 100 coming through. So we got mm -hmm, 10, mm -hmm. we got 10. And so really it made it to a point where these guys wanted to be there, mm -hmm. you know? Now, of course, if you're a highly motivated bad guy, yeah. you could you'll, you'll probably, stick yeah. through yeah. too, but chances are you're gonna show your hand at some stage, you know? But they were good dudes because we ended up um, in the second battle of Fallujah. Uh, we, we got mobilized to go down there because that's when the Marines were fighting in, in Fallujah and obviously the whole kind of PC side of stuff got on board. So they didn't want them going into mosques and they didn't want them going into the graveyards and things. And so they said, we'd bring the Iraqis in and obviously the, the, the most qualified guys were the guys we were training. So we ended up going down with them and, you know, mentoring them through, you know, direct action hits into the mosques and stuff like that. Um, so that was interesting, yeah. So that was, you know, old chocolate chip camouflage, Iraqi flag on one shoulder, American flag on the other shoulder, <laughs> and in kicking doors, and you know, Fallujah and Madi, and we did a lot of uh, direct action work in in around, well, all over really. But um, with the bomb makers was a huge issue at the time. So all the EFPs, you know, uh, different devices were really starting to flood the market. The Biap Road was like that was the road between the airport and uh, Baghdad city. And it was, you know, for quite a long time, it was the most dangerous road in the world. You know, every day somebody died in that road, at least once a day, you know. Um, and a lot of that was down to very, very sophisticated uh, bomb making process they had. So they had, you know, the EFPs directionally formed and uh, directionally aimed. Uh, for, for those that don't know what uh, those uh, devices Sorry, do. Sorry, yeah, EFPs and like, uh, an explosively formed projectile. So it was... Uh, it would defeat armor, basically. So kind of like a, a breaching charge that could be, you know, set at a height. So they would set them so they'd be kind of midsection high. So it was going through doors, penetrating and killing the guy, the driver, they cut them in half, literally, yeah. Yeah. taking a vehicle out or, you know. So, but that takes a, quite a level of skill, you know, so they had whole little factories and, you know, going on. Well, technically it's relatively simple. You need a kind of cone from soft metal and you have you have a explosive in your back yeah. in the back right yeah and that kind of makes the the but then there's your calculations you've taken into consideration mm. for the range that you're going to oh, go yeah, on after yeah. and what you're trying to defeat yeah, yeah. so yeah. they're trying to defeat you know armored humvees which have doors which are you know a couple mm. of inches thick or suburbans or whatever else so uh yeah i mean there is and then you know just from from the manufacturing process you know you need welding shops you need you know you need to be able to put all this stuff together package it up, you know, build a, build a projectile, pack it out with explosives, you know, wrap it up, put it in the vehicle, send it off, put your, 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 you know, your, your support unit, your whatever arm support unit, whatever else, your cell, place that and then initiate, mm. you know, and then that might be initiated and take out a vehicle, but then there'll be, you know, a secondary with an ambush, 
you know like very 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 smart guy i mean look yeah it needs some it's not yet yeah, it's not just like let's do something but it's you can see that there was someone behind it yeah. that thought about it. Yeah, and yeah, 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 absolutely. And so then, much. you know, we obviously had the suicide bombers, which is a huge thing. I mean, <laughs> BiApp was like every day, there was people dying on BiApp, you know. So they were building the vehicles and they were, you know, they were up armoring the vehicles. They were, you know, putting uh, extra springs on it so they didn't sit down. So, you know, we used to be getting a brief, you're like, you know, you're, you got to watch out for a vehicle, a Mercedes or BMW, it's blue, blah, 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 blah. You know, evident down to how they dress, the suicide bomber guys used to, you know, always have a shave and, comb their hair back and be all looking pretty to go to the afterlife she'd always be wary about things like this you know um then just your random opportunistic you know ambush on the buy app a guy decides to get his ak or pkm or you know a little team of four guys had a few beers too many decided yeah let's go down and hit up the guys in the buy app so yeah it was kind of funky times uh, and Do then you think really they had beer no. Maybe hashish? <laughs> Maybe. Oh, well, who knows? <laughs> Maybe okay. this is uh, the best time to ask this. What is your personal opinion about like private sectors in the military? Uh, private sector like security. Like just private, security, private, yeah. Uh, yeah, private look, there's, military there's, there's, absolutely, there's absolutely a place for it. I mean, uh, for, since time immemorial, there's been mercenaries. If you want to call them, you know, I don't, like mercenaries are a very specific team, but I mean, people who work for a fee, a set amount. I mean, the military, as we stand today, cannot operate without private sector support, be that catering, you know, communications. So why not bring yeah. in guys like me? You see, this is the big thing we used to have out there. Guys go, oh, you guys get paid so much. Yeah, but do we? We've no pension, right? Mm -hmm. There's nobody going to look after us if our legs get blown off unless we have an insurance policy, you know? There's no support from the PTSD side of stuff, you know? Plus, and then you there's probably no, do, you know, more sp special things and more dangerous things, so. Yeah, and then there's no, I mean, there's no, there's no kind of support after the fact. When, when, you know, you leave, your contract finishes, you're out, yeah. you're out of work, you know. And like we say to guys, you know, we get guys transitioning across from the military, who literally, like last week were military and this week are, you know, contractors. And you go, guys, there's no big, there's nobody coming to save you. Like, you're into shit, you're into shit, you got to figure it out, you know, work the problem, you know. Um... Yeah, but there's definitely, I think there's definitely, you know, it like even looking at what we did with the, with the convoys, I didn't do it, but companies did the convoy support and stuff like that. That was all done by private sector. That freed up soldiers to be soldiers. And when you have a high operational tempo, you know, like years of war, guys don't want to join the military and go for, like, they, I think the US military are doing like a year tour at a time, minimum, mm -hmm. like 12 months, if not 14 months mm -hmm. with like two weeks leave. You know, like these guys were going stir crazy out there, you know. Now, a lot of these guys didn't go outside the wire. But the guys who did, like we were co-located in, when I was up in our bill, used to get down to Ramadi and, and um, Kirkuk. And Kirkuk had a 75th Ranger Regiment. And they, those guys were kicking doors every other night, you know, rolling up uh, weapons caches and stuff like that. But they had a massive tempo. Their operation tempo was boom, boom, boom all the time. And I don't think they did 12 months, but they, they were... I mean, they were, when they were ready to go home, they were ready to go home, you know, mm. and they were taking casualties because they were getting amongst it, you know. Um, so I think, you know, put it how you want. There's, there's definitely a place, in my opinion, there's definitely a place for, for private sector. You know, yeah, as I say, yeah. even with my company, we provide, you know, executive and close protection to multinationals, you know, so it's, it's the same type of thing. You know, can you do that in-house? You can, but you, you're bringing in, what, why restrict yourself to what you have in the uniform when you can bring in expertise from outside. I wanted to ask this just to, you know, hear firsthand because you have the experience definitely. And probably a lot of people are wondering, you know, why? So I think that's a very important question to, to be answered firsthand. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, it's, it, it offsets the, 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 the commitments that the military have. So all these kind of, we'd say mundane jobs, which they're not mundane moving, you know, kit and equipment from point A to point B, that can be done by contractors. Why not? Mm. You know, medical, you know, outsource it, you know, training. There we go. Perfect example. Train a special forces unit with former special forces. Yeah. You know what I mean? Why, yeah. why tie up the guys that you want kicking doors and taking out bad guys doing a training carter in country, you know, when you can just hire a load of guys that were doing it two months ago on the books for you, you know? Well, the thing here is also, I think, uh, the quality that you get back, uh, because a lot of people don't realize, m maybe now more people realize it more, but 
in the past, the military was like they were the leader in the, the knowledge, the technology, in everything. Now the reality is that military is a government organization and it's really, really bad in, in spending money, organizing stuff, and, and essentially assigning proper people with proper skills to certain you know, tasks. So like you said, for example, like training special forces, there is a big market in, in, in kind of like specialized high-end training for special forces because the government or the military doesn't have the ranges, doesn't have the knowledge. Like it's harder for them. They are too rigid in their operation. And then comes a private company that says, oh, we can get this kind of amount of money. We can build this kind of range and we can yeah. offer this and this. And essentially, yeah, like they employ ex special forces from from around the globe. Exactly. So and you're getting a cross pollination yeah, of yeah. skills and drills. I mean, yeah. that's what it's all about. And if it's done properly, the end result is better than Absolutely. it'll 100%. be just institutionalized. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's what we see from kit and equipment development over. You know, you would as guys, you would have especially seen it. I mean, I know what I used to run as a young soldier compared to what the guys have now. You know, come on. Hmm. I mean, that's guys leaving the military and going, hey, I can make that better. <laughs> you know, and then going back to military and they're going, you know, you're making stuff. And that, that, that's the whole development. There was a guy, um, uh, Danny Chalker was his name back in the day, ex-Navy SEAL Master Chief. And he came up with like the Chalker sling and stuff like that. Met him out in Baghdad, a really cool dude. Uh, famous within teams, to, you know, the Navy SEALs. <coughs> um, but he came up with a load of really high speed stuff, gear, which now is kind of, you know. Normal. Antiquated. But oh. back then it was, you know, it was, wow, this is, wow. You know, mm -hmm. like the three point sling. I mean, nobody had that except us. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's also different because if you wanted a new holster, you got a new holster. If you don't like a Glock, you can probably get something else. But if you're in the army and you say, um, you know, I you don't have to work really well, there's the tendering process, there's everything, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's, and, and it's for the team, not for you. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's very rigid. But you see now the way SF teams have developed. I mean, it's much more, you know, the gear the guys have. I mean, it's like, obviously, it's there. But that's that 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 whole industry has developed. Look at what the way we set our weapon systems up. Come on. Hmm. You know? That stuff there, That's that's, you know... Martian technology compared yeah. to 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, honestly, and I mean, it's, there's still, and it's evolving. Yeah. And it's evolving. Oh, it's, it's ridiculous at the pace it's evolving at, you know? But if you would compare like gear in the, let's say, late 80s to mm. the 2000s, yeah. and then the 2000s to now, do you think it's a bigger Oh, jump? absolutely. I mean, I'm, I remember when I left the teams, I went back like two years later. Just, we used to do like a kind of family day slice show every year and just, just get on the beer, like, but go back and meeting the guys and, you know, just looking at the gear they're looking at it, I'm like this is two years ago wow I mean it's gone you know leaps ahead mm. and we were when I was there it was the latest gear you know we used to have all our own stuff made by, by companies we'd say oh we want this tweak this way that way you know so and then you go back now come on I was there mm. like two years ago was last time I was in the, t in the unit and the lines and I was like well I'm sure since then it's changed you look at the dive gear anything everything the parachuting gear everything everything we have is just you know but that's the beauty of it, you know, guys moving through and then working in the, in, in, in I suppose, in the industry, in the military complex, the military industry, they're, they're, they just come up with these new, you know, kit equipment and techniques. And the nice thing you're saying about, the, you know, a private entity building a training facility, you know, it can be built fit for purpose that covers a multitude of, 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 of scenarios, you know, whereas when you have your, your unit has its own budget, has its own kill house, but it's fairly limited realistically mm. to what they can do you know depends on who the country is and everything else and then you know from from a private uh perspective i can hire dev group guys cag guys you know hereford you know gign whatever you know ssg whatever i can bring guys in from everywhere sit down and we can spend a week in a room and you know we all you know the skills are more or less the same but you know pick the best cherry pick the best and put it put it put a training package together and sell that as a package you know, I'm bringing it to an SF unit and they go, that's really, I, that's impressive. You know, the whole C-clamp thing, not a fan of it, but it is what it is. Um, but that's somebody come up thinking it's a good idea and selling it, you know, it's, mm. it's a work at work, hey. <laughs> I even know a notorious guy that developed uh, <laughs> Grip Clamp C. <laughs> Grip Clamp C, yeah. We made a video yeah. making kind of, it, it's kind of a, a fun poke at the Grip, uh, at the C-clamp C -clamp, grip. Yeah. 
we we call it the grip clamp C, where you grip the gland <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah it's um, yeah, so like the technique works. Um, it has its upsides and downsides. Place, yeah, but like it's but like everything. Before we we divulge to, to this too much, um, how, what's the jump from from uh, Blackwater to Nairobi? How did you get there? What do you, you want? A long there? version or a short version? That's okay, medium. so anyway, let's do media. You want to go home tonight? Uh, uh, we would like to hear the for the backstory before we dig. <laughs> not, not, but a two sentence backstory. <laughs> yeah, so basically, I did some more time in Iraq. You know, got blown up. My wife, I think she was my wife at the time. Yeah, it was my wife at the time. She's like, look, I'm sick of this shit. You know, you're coming or going. So I said, okay, packed it up, went home. And um, she had gone through university and became an engineer and whatever else. And I'd kind of always had a little niggling. I wanted to join the police. So I went and I joined the police at home. A couple of years of those. And Ireland went through a massive recession. The Celtic Tiger, we call it, where it just the economy tanked. Tanked, literally. Which year was this? This would have been 2007, 8, 9. Mm -hmm. Probably you know, 8 10. when everything yeah, went to shit. Yeah, went, same, uh, same, yeah, yeah and yeah. Ireland, got, we got really badly hit. I was a quite a junior police officer, you know, doesn't matter age-wise, whatever else. Doing a few other bits and pieces as well. Um, yeah, and, you know, I had put in for, so she lost her job as an engineer, you know, because kind of last in, first out type of thing. She'd moved to the UK uh, and I had then applied to different police forces in the UK to try and, you know, we, we said, right, we're going to have to live in, in the UK at this stage. So that had gone on. I had just been accepted for the, the police service in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, well, I didn't know I'd been accepted, but I was, I was basically at the last phase. So it was kind of yes or no at that stage. And I, you know, taken a year to get to that point. And I was in the UK and I got a, an email from a company called Control Risks. They were like, hey, actually, I tell lie, I was in the airport flying over and I got a phone call and there was a storm going on. And they were like, hey, you know, you want a job with us? You know, we have your bio here, you know, you're fit to bill, you got the maritime stuff. And that's when the piracy was really getting big out in uh, West Africa, East mm -hmm. Africa and West Africa. Um, and they said, look, we'd love to come, come and see us in London. So I was like, well be there so I'll come over and see you guys so I've seen them and they're like yeah we want to give you a job you know so will you go to Nigeria and uh, deal with an oil company and help them set up defense against piracy on the oil rigs so, okay okay so jumped on a jumped on the plane out I went uh, a week later my buddy was checking my mail at home and he goes hey there's a letter here you have to report to Belfast to join <laughs> the police <laughs> so I was like hmm, what do I do so I said, look, I am where I am now. I've given a commitment for a couple of months, so I'll stick with it. So I stayed there with Control Risks. Worked West Africa, the anti-piracy stuff. Uh, then I joined a company called Slumberger, or Slumberger, uh, the biggest oil and gas uh, services company in the world, French company. Um, and yeah, from there, I did work with them in Lagos, in, or in Port Harcourt, I should say, on the team down there. And then they sent me to Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, running project down there for them, uh, Gabon. And then because I had been in Kenya in a previous life, they had said, hey, we're going to expand because the oil price was starting to get really, really high, like 120 a barrel stuff. They wanted to start exploration in East Africa. So they said, well, you go over, you've experience over there and help us set up. So I jumped across and, excuse me, uh, Slumberjay basically, you know, put their head office in Nairobi, started building out across East Africa onshore and offshore uh, and I was there kind of uh, I was initially the Kenya kind of security advisor and then they made me the East Africa guy so I ran you know kind of between 9 and 11 countries right all the staff and we did all that type of stuff so that would have been 2011 11 yeah so I was there 2012 you know very very busy kind of flying all over East Africa setting up offices and checking rig sites and all that type of stuff just so really interesting time lots of Africa exposure and um, just really really genuinely good times and then 2013 I had just promoted into that 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 senior post and uh, my boss who is ex Hereford he had come over to he so there's two guys kind of run the entire world for Slumberger in-house and we would have been contracted in as uh, subject matter experts for from true control risks he had come over to kind of assess me and I'm, I was still quite young I was still only in my 30s at the time and um, at the position I was in it was kind of a, a 50 year old kind of position 
you know, so everybody's kind of looking, you know, is this guy really set for this job or should we send him somewhere else to get more experience at that level? Um, and yeah, it was uh, the 21st of September, 2013, as I remember. And my boss was over on the Thursday and the Friday. And then on that Saturday, which was a Saturday, we, I had set up a meeting with another one of our clients, Tullow Oil, a big Irish oil company, Irish owned oil company. And uh, we were in Westgate Mall and sitting down having coffees and just going through business and blah, blah, blah. And there kind of all morning, jumped in the car, drove back to the office. I would have worked kind of seven days when I was over there. Um, back to the office and of course, after drinking coffee all morning, what's the first thing you do when you go back to the office? Drink beer. Drink more coffee. <coughs> uh, so, oh, sorry. More beer, yeah, no. <laughs> Different that's, office. That's, 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 <laughs> Different. <laughs> so yeah, we were back in the office and my phone vibrated and text came through and it was the same guy we had just had the meeting with and he was like, al Shabab attack Westgate Mall now. And I was like, yeah, whatever, dude, you know. <laughs> and he's like, no, now. I was like, right, okay. So I ran out to, uh, to TAF and I said, Hey boss, there's, it's going down at, at Westgate, you know? And he was like, well, where is Westgate? And I said, the place we've just been sitting for the last three hours. And he's like, oh, really? Okay. So we had, I developed a, a procedure to find, you know, make sure we can manage all our staff. Nobody drove themselves. So we had drivers. I tracked all the vehicles. You know, everybody told us if they're going to be in and out of country, so we can manage all that. So we, I could figure out within four or five minutes where all my expatriate staff were. Okay. And probably 80% of my local staff. Okay, so we then figured out that we had a husband and wife at the mall because we could track and see the vehicle mm -hmm. and see it was parked outside. Got in touch with the driver because in the event of attack, you don't ring the guy directly to you. You rang the, rang the driver and he was like, yeah, he's inside having dinner. Well, by the way, there's something going on here. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Thanks for that, you know. <laughs> so then I, we started texting him and sending him emails and stuff. And then he responded. And he's like, yeah, I'm in a restaurant called Onami Restaurant, which is on the top floor. Uh, facing over the car park uh, in the corner. So I'm new, was very, very familiar with the building. So I was like, okay, okay, cool. So then I said, okay, uh, where are you now? And he goes, look, there's a lot of, and he would have been very experienced oil worker, been in Libya and stuff. So he's like, there's, there's AKs going off all around this place, you know? So I said, oh, fair, fair enough. Who's with you, wife? I said, okay, out into the storeroom at the back, lock the doors to steal the door. He goes, okay. I says, don't open that door until I bang on it. He he had never met me, so he's only in country actually three days at that stage. Um, but again, a very experienced guy, and this was his <laughs> it was his first posting overseas with his wife. Everything's right? gonna be okay, honey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this you know the guy had spent thirty years in the oil industry, and it was the first time. It was his last contract, oh, and shit. the first time he's like, "This is Kenya. Well, you know, safaris the weekend. You know, mm. don't even have to leave Nairobi. We can go." go and do a safari outside the city. That's one question. How would you assess the security or, or situation in the country, in the city before the attack? Yeah, so I mean, just before that, you had the uh, Kenyan, um, so there was obviously issues kind of between Kenya and Ethiopia. Big problems with Somalia. And then, I mean, there's a huge black market there for charcoal, which would you believe is a massive uh, money spinner for Al Shabaab. Uh, and Kenya had, uh, I can't remember the name of the, what they called it, um, but they had basically a peace enforcement mission into Somalia, which kind of northern Kenya, you know, so that kind of stoked the fires of, mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. of uh, issues and hatred between Somalia or Al-Shabaab and Kenya. And let's say a day before the attack, would you, would you expect something like that? So were you our, our concerns, yeah, there was always because we've obviously had the, uh, the terrorist attacks in at the embassy and stuff. Prior to that, there was always something, you know, I suppose the cool thing about being in the industry and stuff, it didn't matter what company you worked for. Every kind of Thursday, we went and had beers and all the security managers would sit around and shoot the shit. And, you know, uh, there was, you know, in briefs every week, you know, it was a very, it's a very social kind of environment where you'd sit and you talk to guys and see, so you'd always know what was going on. And somebody go, hey, I got contacts and such and such. And we've heard there's might be a V-bed driving around town, you know wasn't something that really happened prior to that or there was you know a lot of criminality in one area you know there was a corrupt team of cops running around the place whatever happened to be you know but still it was still north up Lamu direction so it was didn't really affect Nairobi but the threat was always there mm -hmm. you know and then you had a place called Eastling uh just out towards the airport and between the CPD the the the, the, uh, the business district 
And that was kind of a no-go area anyway. So there was all kind of things there. And then, of course, you had the refugee camps in, you know, the biggest in the world in northern Kenya. So there was always an undercurrent, you know. But if I understand correctly, Westgate was kind of the higher up area. Yeah, it was uh, the commercial business, CBD, mm -hmm, commercial mm -hmm. business district. Very, very high-end mall. Um, yeah, just... Uh, but, you know, it was funny because what I was saying, I had been in Kenya prior to that. That's why I was asked to go back over originally. I remember Kenya, uh, Kenya uh, Westgate wasn't there. It was another mall. Can't think of the name of it now. And I remember sitting there in that, that mall with my friend, who was an ex-team guy as well. I remember looking around kind of going, wow, if I was a terrorist. And this was, <laughs> no, honestly, and I said, if I was a terrorist, this place, you'd, you'd, you'd make hay, you know? Easy um, target. Yeah, yeah, super, super easy. And then, yeah, hey. A couple of years later and Westgate <laughs> Mall is there and it, it, it happened. So yeah, we, we were in the office, identified where everybody was and told him to kind of shelter in place. I went and see my boss and said, I'm going to go in and have a look, you know, because again, Al-Shabaab, is it a robbery? You know, which was, you know, these things can happen. People get things mixed up. So didn't really know. So, you know, as they say, the only truth is ground truth. So get out and get your boots on the ground and get a mark one eyeball on it. Um, <laughs> So out uh, we went, jumped out of the car, and it was it was pretty chaotic. A lot of gunfire, explosions. So we um, jumped over a gate that had been closed, which would have been the um, the uh, access for deliveries and things. Um, I, again, another question. I'm sorry, but some some things I'm really interested in. So um, you drove there. Like, did you decide to take any? I don't know, like ammo, gear. Or we don't boots? have any ammo or gear. I had a polo Nothing. shirt and a. Pair Adidas trainers. That was what was going. Pair of jeans. No, no gun. No, no gun. No, nothing. No. Not even a med kit. So yeah, you couldn't have it. No, you at the time, you know, you could get a firearm, but extremely difficult, and then company policy and all these type of things as well. So, so you drove unarmed to a yep. terrorist attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you probably had a pocket knife or something. No, nothing. Literally nothing. <laughs> <laughs> My mobile phone. That was about it. And um, again, we just went for a look. Uh, window shopping, I guess. But yeah, we um, we got there and yeah, we we decided to try and gain entry. You know, it was there was gunfire and there was shooting and stuff like this. But it, you know, again, we didn't know how bad it was, and we we had kind of between us had said, look, we we might be able to pick something up as we go along. You know, a cop might have dropped something, or you know, because the old discipline wouldn't be so high, or we might be able to get one off somebody. Got in, went down into the underground car park, and uh, I remember picking a radio up off the table where the security guard would have sat, and it was a kind of a where you know underground car park, the glass areas. So we went in there, there was a ramp, and it was just it was going going off inside with gunfire, and we kind of looked at each other and I said, "We're not entering through the underground ramp. That's just we're going to get dead." So we went back to the underground car park. I remember there's an old man, with a couple of ship, shopping bags, he's just standing there going, what "The fuck is going on?" And we we're like, "You need to come with us." So we're moving him out and then somebody starts shooting at us from inside the car park. So we kind of leg up the stairs, up the, up the ramp, back onto the, the area, pointing to the left and say, head that way, you'll be good to go. We look down to the right and that's where the loading bay was for the back of the Nakumat's big shop and stuff like that. And there's about 150 people there. And then that's when we started to come across the wounded people. So in, in the military, normally when you come across in a hostage situation, you need to process your you know, your, your, the civilians, whoever you happen to be, if that's in a boat or a plane or whatever else, a house. Um, so there's two of us and we're trying to process them because we don't know if there's a shooter mixed up in them or a suicide bomber or whatever else. So we're trying to do a quick pat down. And, you know, I suppose you're dominating the situation, you know? Well, so you're people, are, people are looking at you and they're kind of going, well, okay, these guys aren't, excuse me, aren't doing what we're doing. We're hiding behind cars. They're standing out there going, you know, come to me, do what you got to do, pat people down. But I suppose a couple of people looked at me because, hey, you don't have a, a gun by any chance, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of those kind of, you know? Uh, no, so keep going that way. So we moved about 150 people, and then we came across one guy with, um, with, a, with a pistol in, a, in a, a blue blazer. He's actually on some of the pictures and stuff. So we grabbed him and we said, right. And I had looked up uh, from the underground car park, or from the, 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 the loading bay, and it was kind of white, um, metal louvered kind of windbreakers on the upstairs car park and i seen a hand waving out and it was obviously covered in blood because the blood kept on like getting streamed on the and on, on the white louvers and i was like wow it's bad up there but what i didn't realize at the time even though i had been in there there was a kids cookery competition up there 
and that's the terrorists had gone through that place. Shit. Shooting you know, kids. Ki shooting kids, oh. throwing grenades, and executing people, you know? But we weren't aware of that at this stage. My focus was the opposite corner to where I was standing. So I was in the back right corner, or back left, yeah, back right corner, and my clients were in the top left corner. And my goal in my head was to get up there. So unarmed, grabbed a guy, a uh, drunken police officer as he was, was clashing the coffin. I said, you need to give me that. And he's like, nope, not giving a chip. So, okay, come with me then. And then as I jumped up onto the loading bay, there was a guy in a camouflage smock and he had a G3 and he came running in panic with his little black beret on. He's like, oh, boss, 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 boss. And I was like, whoa, slow down. And he goes, I said, what are you doing? You know, and he's like, no, my gun doesn't work. My gun doesn't work. And he had three rounds in his hand. And I said to him, get another mag, do a mag change. And he goes, oh, what? I said, and then I said to him, you know, we have a term, bomb up your magazine. You know, that means just put rounds into your mag. And he's like, I said, just give me your fucking magazine. I put the three rounds, you know, checked them. They weren't damaged, looked okay. So whether he had a stoppage and cycle through and they were three rounds that landed on the ground, at least he picked them up. I said, okay, you got three rounds. So I said, you with me brought them down into the corridors, which would have been the emergency escapes corridors from the shopping mall. Threw a load of shopping trolleys into the corridor and I posted him and I said, anybody with a gun comes through there, you got three times to hit him, you know, but stay there. And funnily enough, I guess, you know, there, well, you go back, there was no command and control in this place. So there was, there was police officers, they would guard banks and they would guard jewelry stores and you could pay the local commissioner and say, hey, I want a guy to sit outside my jewelry store. I'll pay you $200 a week. You know, and they give you one of their police officers to sit there seven days a week for eight hours. So you would walk around a shopping mall in Kenya and you'd see a guy or a girl with an MP5 and a guy with an AK-47 and a guy with a G3 sitting outside a bank or whatever. And they're literally paid just by sit. private enterprises just to sit there, right? <laughs> and they'll have a magazine. They may or may not have ammunition in it, but there's no command and control, right? So he'll be from this district and she'll be from here, mm -hmm. different uniforms, whatever else. There's no radios. Or if there is, it's between two people or three people. But there's no centralized point of control in that mall to say, right, all the police officers in here who are armed, you know, you know, report in the morning, check your stuff, and that's your post. That doesn't work like that. How would you how would you um, describe the the level of um, training that these shocking, officers? Shocking, shocking, okay. shocking. Yeah, I mean, look, <clears throat> a job like that out in that part of the world is really, you know, it's it's all about who you know or how much you pay, and it's done because they can, you know, they can get money off people. Today, a student, yeah. to, tomorrow, a police officer, basically, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think what they what they did react well was direction. So when there was guys coming in going, you stay there and point your rifle at that, they were like, oh, okay, well, this guy's after telling me to do something. So now I have, you know, because they are, it doesn't matter how bad they are, they do have some sort of military, paramilitary or police training. So they understand, you know, when the DS, the instructor comes in and goes, rah, 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 <laughs> well, they generally do it, you know? So it worked. So then we had multiple stairways to clear. So we grabbed all the guys that we could with weapon systems, AKs or pistols, whatever. And we had a little, you know, snake. And then I grabbed a guy that looked kind of halfway squared away with his pistol. And I said, give me the pistol and stand behind me. And, you know, I'll start clearing the, clearing the stairs. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm an off duty cop. And I was like, buddy, stand behind me. When I get shot, you can take it back. You know, he's like, no, no. And I said, right, well, you're going point man then. And then he's like, and I said, we need to get up these stairs. And I'd really like to have a gun. You know, he's like, okay, I'll do it. So then the only way I can describe it is like when you have a recruit and you're trying to teach them how to do a corner drill, you know, and I have this guy by the shoulders and I'm watching him trying to <laughs> use his hand, cover up there, look up there, you know, and he's, I never forget it. He's, he's going up the stairs and he's hand on the slide like that. And I'm just like, just need a fucking gun, <laughs> you know, but anyway, and then Taff is, you know, just two or three guys between us with AKs or G3s, whatever. And he's down the back and he's got a guy by the shoulders covering back down the stairs as we're going up. And each landing we get to, we, we drop security, just like we would in the teams. You know, we drop post security and secure our ingress point. So we're going through, up through three flights of stairs. And all the time, just people bursting through doors and running down the stairs and, you know, we're trying to process them and getting up, there's people hiding in bins and there's people hiding in air conditioning units. So it's, you know, people wounded. So we're getting through. So we get up onto the, um, it was the Java house, it was the cafe up at the top. So we get up there and, uh, I, I thought it was a metal door. It was actually a giant freezer they had pushed against the door. And I'm looking over my right shoulder and it's all glass because it looks out into the glass seating area and everything else. I can see guys, bad guys, walking around, sure. you know, that haven't really 
copped on to the point that we're where we are. It's only two panes of glass away. I'm like, fucking hell. So I moved this, pushed this, what I thought was a door, and it was on wheels. And then there's loads of guys in there, and they're all, you know, wide eyed looking at me. And I'm like, okay, we're here. We're the good guys. Down the stairs, keep going. Bottom left, left, and out onto the road. And they're like, happy days, gone. And I picked up a big uh, meat cleaver, you know, from the kitchen. <laughs> I thought, well, at least I have something, you know. Okay, well, so, well <laughs> <laughs> so off can, we go. I can imagine how frustrating it has to oh, be, yeah, like, yeah. where you have guys armed with rifles that don't know what they're doing. And just, uh, yeah. Like, I, it, it, I'm trying to, when, when you're explaining this to me, I, I'm trying to imagine the whole thing and just, like, you leading the front without a weapon. It's like, you know what? Meat cleaver. <laughs> you know it, what? It just, no, but it, it's, it's a very... Um, <laughs> what pops it's, it's out hard it's hard to explain but this is like yeah it, it's a fun story right now but that's 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 brave I, I i don't know if that's the right word but it's like you have brass balls that, that's <laughs> and now he will say or stupid i know more stupid, stupid. No, but, yeah. <laughs> more stupid. Know, my <laughs> wife will tell you stupid yeah it, it, it tells a lot about a person like people are, are shooting bombs are going off you know there's panic people are dying and you rush the building without a weapon. It's, just, it, it, it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, it's, it's a fun story right now, but yeah, just yeah, yeah. for people listening, um, it, 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 not a lot of people are willing to do that. Right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and you have to, I mean, I get, uh, look. And you are doing the Vasilis ISO thing. So basically you have ammo, you have <laughs> rifle, <Yeah. laughs> let's go. Yeah, honestly, yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, <laughs> look, I guess, <clears throat> I would be supremely confident in my abilities from the years I spent in the military and the other shit I've been through, you know? So I know, you know, I'm confident in me doing what I'm doing and I'm confident in saying, you know, as stupid as it might, might seem, if I can affect the rescue or the, the secure my clients, well then, yeah, now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, it's fucking stupid, isn't it? You know what I mean? Honestly, going to a shopping mall with no gun, even if you have a gun and no team, you know, it's not really a smart thing to do. But, you know, for me, it was the natural thing to do, you know? Mm. And I didn't do it for, you know, an award or paycheck or anything else. I just did it because kind of duty of care, I guess. I mean, deep down, they were, even though I'd never met the guy and his wife, I was there to provide a level of security for them. And, you know, I know once I reached out and contacted them, they were like, well, he said he's going to come. So unless somebody, you know, took me out on the way in, I would would have done my damnedest to get them, which I did. But yeah, we got into Java and again, me cleaver, but I'm a medic. And now we'd seen some, you know, carnage on the way at this stage, you know, lots of gunshot victims and people, you know, bleeding out and tied up and whatever. So I looked out to the, the, um, the car park, the upstairs car park, through, there was like a little low wall with bamboo shoot plants on it and there was an ambulance parked there. And I thought, hmm, ambulance. I didn't know the status of my client, so I said, if I can grab a crash bag out of there, at least I'll have some med kit with me. So I went over, jumped over the wall. So I said to Taff, I said, just hold, hold where you are. I'm going to jump over the wall here and see if I can grab a, a crash bag, you know? So the doors are all locked. And behind that ambulance was, you know, the typical African kind of, excuse me, tents. And I don't know to this day why I decided to walk down there. That was the kids co cooking competition. Oh, shit. Right? And then I walked down, I just started mentally taking off dead, 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 going dunk, 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 dunk in my head. And there's people sitting there screaming and crying and blood everywhere, you know, body parts. Uh, and then you get down, there's like 100 people wedged into this corner, you know, bodies literally, you know, bleeding out in front of them, bits of heads missing and an unexploded grenade with the fly-off lever gone off. It's sitting in front of them. And I'm like, okay. And if I look over to my right in the car park, there's bodies who people have tried to run away, people under cars, you know, kids in buggies that were dead in their little push chairs, you know, grandmothers, you know, trying to do CPR on their husbands, you know, so it was carnage, absolute carnage. And, you know, in that I had counted multiple, multiple, multiple amounts of dead. So I was like, fuck. Okay, unexploded ordnance, fucking carnage up here, you know? And who knows where these guys are gonna pop out again. So I ran out back towards the, the, the ambulance, back to the Java, and I said to Taff, I said, buddy, we've got a fucking major situation out here. We need to move these people. And he's like, what's happened? I said, look, it's just carnage. So they had gone through with their AKs, shot up everything else. They've been throwing frags. 
and then the gas cylinders had exploded. So you had secondary and tertiary explosions. You know, it was just the worst possible. And then, you know, they had actually lined people up and executed them, say, you know, recited a chapter of the Quran, a verse from the Quran, you know, if you weren't Muslim. So they had gone along and, you know, lined people up and just shot them, shot the pregnant women in the stomachs and shot them in the face, oh. you know. Um, the religion of peace. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so we, we were there and then you got this crazy fucking two white guys standing there, hey, come on, and there's a mix. It's very, very um, multi-ethnic society, Nairobi, as you imagine. You know, it's a melting pot. So there's Indians, Asians, Europeans, you know, Africans, you name it, people from fucking Mars, everybody there. So you're like, come on, stand up, let's go. So, and I remember myself going, hey, you know, we're, we're special forces. And they were kind of, mm, okay. Right, and I'm like, you, no guns, no body armor, no helmets, no, no, no cool guy stuff. And there's two of us there, and we're like, you know, we need to move, you guys, we need to go. And my 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 colleague Taff, there was a, he said to one of this 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 guy, big a sheet guy, and he had the turban and everything on. He's like, you know, you're a fucking warrior, you're a warrior warrior tribe, you know, stand up and fucking get these people to go. So he stood up, and he picked up a, she was a wounded woman, like she had been shot to shit, and he picked her up. And yeah, we started moving and people started, you know, the sheep effect. Once you mm -hmm, get one going, mm -hmm. somebody else to go, they go, oh, there's a glimmer of hope there. And now you have to remember, we had secured that stairway, you know, so we had dropped security all the way. So for us, that was, that was clear. So we started moving people. But then one of these dickheads popped up on the roof and started shooting down into us. And we lost one or two in that. But at that stage, we were like, just keep going, keep the momentum going. And then he dropped away, whether to come down and engage with us from, you know, floor level or whatever. But the mo momentum was going. So at that stage, you know, anybody who could walk could walk. They were going. So we're like, okay, good to go. So we start putting them down through the kitchen. And then as people are going through, you know, when you're going through a normal door, there's 50 people trying to get through a doorway that's, you know, fit for one person. And then it stops. And I'm panicking because I'm looking over my shoulder and I'm seeing people walking around with AK-47s on the floor that are going to figure out in a couple of seconds that there's loads of civilians trying to escape. And... I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm pushing people, you know? And it, I hear this, hey, hey, hey. I'm like, what? And he goes, do you want a gun? I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> and then this hand comes out with a silver CZ-75, right? And I'm like, okay, right? And I reach in, I grab the guy and I pull him out and I put him behind the, the, the counter, the bar counter. And I'm like, fuck, okay. I put the gun down, oh, I put in my, my ass crack holster or whatever I put on the counter, I can't remember. And I'm like, on my phone out and I was like, yeah, I normally have business cards from the company. And I was like, oh, fuck, I have no business card. Give me your phone number. And he's like, why? And I said, well, if I'm alive tomorrow, I'll give you back your phone or your gun. He's like, okay. So he gave me his number, but I was missing a digit and I didn't have his name. But anyway, that was neither here nor there. Put the phone <laughs> in my pocket, popped the magazine, right, 15 rounds, cocked it, locked it. And I was like, and I grabbed the guy, the, the, the guy that in the blazer that had come up the stairs me. And I said, buddy, we're going across. So we're now on the top floor in the opposite corner from where clients are. And he looked at me as to say, you have your shit, right? And I was like, you're stacking up with me, we're going. So that's where that bit of CCTV footage comes out, you know, right? and out we go. So we only break the door by about five or six meters and they, they, they light us up from the other side of the, uh, the, the top floor. With so AKs? AKs, so I did a I, real- I, I saw some of the footage where they're using tracers. Yeah, tracers. They had a, yeah, you you could see like from the footage, you could see some of like I was surprised to see kind of like yeah. streaks and mixed belt. Yeah, but yeah, so I did a real you know die hard job and fired two or three rounds over my shoulder. You know, anyway, just keep your heads down. Ran and then there was the cinema theater on the top floor, so ran around there. But they had been firing from there, and there was a load of empty shell casings. And I ran. And I slipped on the shell case. And so I remember sure. falling backwards and hitting my head off the marble floor. Shit. Have uh, you ever hit your head really hard? Yeah. It makes you feel sick. And mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to get sick. But these guys were literally only 30 or 40 meters away. So I shook it off and I popped up my knee and I popped around the corner. And there they were coming towards me. So I, you know, stuck three rounds into one of them. He goes over and his buddy ran away. And lots of people asked me. So he was after going over and I'm like, yeah, was he dead? Oh, fucking no, he was on his ass ass for sure, right? I go, why didn't he go and get his AK off him? Like that's, that wasn't, you know, this isn't Hollywood. You know, I didn't know what was up there. I knew my clients were over here. I knew I had a pistol. I knew I had, at that stage I had six rounds because um, I had counted them. So I was like, why, you know, I suppose in my mind I was, I was, you know, 
that was my 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 process. I'm not going up there, you know. I'm just going to stay where I am. Keep on going to the client and get shook out with that. And I looked over my shoulder and I said, "Okay, you, you know, we're going around this corner." And the guy was like, "No, I'll call for backup." I'm like, oh, well, that would have been great if you did that like an hour ago. But hey, <laughs> anyway, and then he just disappears, takes off me. So I'm now left by myself. So I'm now I'm like, I got to get to the. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm Before that close we to the continue, client. Continue again, again. I, I just like. Some points are so interesting that I, I think we shouldn't uh, jump over them. Um, so you rounded the corner and you saw two terrorists running towards you. Yeah, so they were, you'd have to kind of see the builders' pillars and then metal railings in between it. So it's <clears> kind <throat> of line of sight. You know, if you're offset a little bit, there's a pillar built into a pillar, which creates like a meter uh, of, you know, obstructed view. But as you kind of breach that corner, you can see down the, the, the whole pathway of the top of the, the, the mezzanine floor so i was there as i say i had slipped on all these shell casings by my head shook myself off stuck up and then that, those pillars were kind of blocking my view as i popped around the corner because i knew because they had shot me from mm -hmm. that end already so i knew they'd be closing in on me i popped the corner and then you know i just presented and engaged and you know hit one center mass and over he went and then his buddy was like yep fuck this i'm out of here <laughs> took off you know um live to fight another day but now this is you're talking seconds mm, you know mm. and at that stage like that 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 decision making process i went through do i go and grab the ak or not? that was probably you know a hundred of a second it took to go through my head to make the decision no and then to turn left well to turn to my guy and say let's go and he was like no i'm gonna make a phone call and get back up and then he disappeared so i went to to get my client so yeah, we, I ran to the door, big glass doors, and there was a lock on it, and the doors were locked. And I was constantly looking over my shoulder going, his buddy's going to come back now, trying to kill me, but it's dog-legged, if you can imagine. So I had a bit of cover from view. I'm pushing at the door, and I'm like, fuck. And then, you know, stupid things that you're, I remember, and then I suppose go through your head. I said, like, I'll just shoot the lock. You know, and rule 101 of breaching school is don't shoot glass and metal things. You know, don't ricochets, you know. And, I, you know, again, a hundred of a second, I'm like, you know, I have this conversation, you know, people say things slow down. I, I genuinely believe that's true because yeah. I had a conversation with my kid. Like, I can remember now going, well, don't be a fucking retard. You're going to shoot yourself. You know what I mean? Oh, you bleed out because you shot your ricochet, you know? <laughs> but anyway, I put my shoulder to the door and popped the locks and went through. And there was a big chef there with a big meat cleaver, you know, like from Sesame Street, but to chop my head off. And I said, oh, it's okay. I'm here. You know, and he's like, okay. I said, but stay there. Anybody else comes through, feel free to chop him in the head because there's nobody behind me. He's like, okay. <laughs> And again, there's people behind the bar in the air conditioning units in the walls coming out of the ceiling because they hear this me run around. So I went straight out the back, bang on the door and shout Slumberjay, Slumberjay, Slumberjay. The door opens up and I called his name, the client's name and didn't know who he was, just grabbed him, pulled him out. And I said, right, I'm here. You're with me. We're getting out of here. And his wife is there. And I didn't realize, but they were quite old. So I was like, fuck, okay. So I was like, right, I got to get out. So what we do, we take the back. Uh, emergency escape around a fire that we hadn't normally you'd always trace back your steps because it's a clear route but because i had no security posted it mm -hmm. wasn't a secure, clear route anymore so i said right the chances of these guys having somebody in the emergency escape behind the cinema is going to be pretty slim so i stacked up a load of uh, a load of survivors and i said we're going to go out this door we're going to take a right and we're going to box all the way around there'd be another door there right one will lead onto the car park and the other one will lead back into the building wait there but i'll be right behind you then I got my, my clients, we call them, and I got a load of people behind us. So I sandwiched us. So I was kind of herding all these people around, hoping if somebody shoot, shot that You're at least I'd have, I'd have a little bit of time to figure it out, you know? They weren't my clients, but hey, nobody shot at us. That was all fine. Got to the and of course, they had the, the emergency escape onto the car park locked. So I'm like, fuck, so now we have to go back in again. So, okay, so at that stage, I'm like, right. I grabbed the client and I said, to his wife, I says, there's your husband's belt, hold on to it, okay? And then I said to him, I said, you hold on to my belt and you do not let go because I'm not stopping, right? And he was like, okay. So we go out and <laughs> like a game of chase with kids, you know, I had two people behind me and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> run through this mall and the guy starts shooting at us again. It's all glass windows and all the glass starts falling. But you know, it's, and then she fell, would you believe? She uh -huh. actually fell. But the people that were running with us just scooped her up. I mean, I remember her fe feeling her fall and then, like, she just got lifted. And I was actually a little bit lighter for a second until she got her foot in again. And bang, like a little snake. It was only about <clears throat> 20 meters. Well, it was a long 20 meters. In, down, and then they were just holding on. And then I was running down the stairs, you know, like jumping steps. And they were 
you know, hopping and skipping and down and outside. And I run out onto the road and he, they're hanging out their asses. They're like, you know, out we get. And I said, okay, we're good to go. I said, we got to go now up onto this other road. <clears throat> um, and they were like, okay, keep going. So ran them up and dumped them down into a ditch. And Taff was there, my, my boss. And uh, he kind of seen me running past. And I was like, all good. So he's a happy day. So I'm on the phone then. <laughs> and I'm ringing my office. I'm like, get a car down here now. Get a car down here now. So a car came in, put them in the car. I said, go back and see the country manager. She'll be in the office. I'll come and give you a debrief later on. And they were like, okay. You know, go back to the office. Yeah. That was that. So they went off. And then taught myself, right, give me yourself five seconds here, ran back and Taff was outside and he had the on-scene commander, right? So they hadn't put cordons out, they hadn't done anything. So it was news crews walking in and out, there was no cordons. And I remember he was like, you give us some weapon system, we're special forces, give us some weapon systems, give us some guys and we'll contain it. You know, and again, supremely confident in our abilities, you know, way, well, way higher level of training than anybody else in the ground. We said, just mm -hmm. give us six or seven shooters, We'll contain it. We'll take the fight back to these guys because at the moment they're marauding, they're moving around, you know. Um, and they were like, "No, no." And that was actually caught on the news. I was on the news that night because we were sitting having a beer that night, and you could see him going, "Give me, you know, we're special forces. Give us, da, 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 you know." And then it got removed off the news because it was bad, bad juju for the uh, for the government. <laughs> so yeah, we. Um, I said to Taff, I says, "I'm going back in," and he goes, "Okay." So I carjacked a, <laughs> an ambulance. You know, at gunpoint, I said, give me a trauma kit, because they wouldn't go in. So they gave me a trauma bag. I said to Taff, I'm going back in, there's people bleeding it out on the roof. So we just grabbed anybody that we could see with guns. So Dan's friend, Peter, and one other guy, and we, we stacked up and snaked in and cleared back up the stairways and went out and started working, you know, providing kind there's of first responders. Three, well, it's uh, six bullets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and, and again, just <laughs> for people listening, it's it's... <laughs> It's an interesting situation because you went there, you did your mission, you saved your client, everyone is safe, and then you still decide to go back in. Yeah, there's people dying. It requires a special kind of you person, know? yeah, but I understand. Special yeah. kind of stupid, yeah. <laughs> so no, there was, no, there was, I mean, look, there was, nobody, there was nobody providing medical assistance there at that stage. So people were bleeding to death. So, you know, I'm a well-trained medic, so, you know, and Taff would be a well-trained <clears> medic. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I mean, we didn't have stretchers. We didn't have anything. We were using tablecloths, the red tablecloths and the, the, the trestle tables as stretchers. And, you know, we were the first, the first person I moved off that, that rooftop was in a pickup truck, right, an old Indian guy. And I had a BVM, you know, the bag valve mask. And I, I, he was, you know, sucking chest wound a whole lot. We did what we could with him. His wife, quite heavy set people, you know, probably late 60s, early 70s, put them in the back. He actually died on the way to hospital, you know? But he was the first person we, we, we packaged and put on the wagon to get out of there. And she sat there with the BVM. Now, she was completely lost her mind. But I mean, she, at least I had her with the BVM. So just, you need to keep air in his lungs because if you don't, he's going to drown, mm. you know? But anyway, he didn't make it. I know that for a fact. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, we went up and we stayed up there for an hour and a half. And yeah, I was probably one of the last, we were the last guys to come off that roof. And there's, you know, there's loads of other stories where we, you know, there came very good friends of people up there and we were kind of trying to separate people, husbands and wives, um, you know, because like he had been shot so bad. Simon and Amanda Belcher, um, they own a safari company out there and he'd been shot. He was hiding under a car and the guy, <laughs> how bizarre is life? The terrorists was walking around, they were hiding under a car and nobody could see them. And he went to do a magazine change. He dropped his magazine. When he went down to pick it up, he looked over and he seen them under the car. Q was a cucumber, put the mag on, fired rounds. And he was hiding, trying to protect his wife. And the round went in here, through his elbow, and out through his bicep. So shattered his arm, basically shot twice with the same round. Um, and he was, you know, bleeding to death when we met him. And, you know, uh, we said to, to her, we didn't realize her husband and wife were like, she was okay. And we said, like, you know, leave him. You come now. We get him, we work on him and we get him down. She's like, I'm not leaving. And she abused us and everything else. But she was like, no, I understand what you were trying to do. We became very good friends since Simon and Amanda. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the reality of it. And then, yeah, I mean, with mothers and fathers with kids who had been shot and they don't want to leave their kids. And they're like, can you help them? And we're literally poking the kids in the eyes and saying they're dead, you know? And mm. So that's stuff that's been said back to us. And it's just stuff that we would do, you know? That's been said back to us multiple times, you know. I remember you guys coming around and trying to, you know, triage basically. 
mm-hmm. you know, move the walking wounded or those uninjured away and then, you know, leave less bodies because it's an ongoing terror attack, which lasts for four days. Yeah, I heard about it. Um, uh, I think we already spoke about this uh, with Daniel. Um, did the terrorist attack really lasted for four days? Were the terrorists still alive? In, in like in the four day it, it was, was four days it was index in four days i mean okay. i i don't know i wasn't there day four you know because even even on the news you could see footage like later on where where the canyon forces kind of went into the mall and like they were looting and, and yeah i mean and they, and they had blue on blues and all sorts of things i mean you know the the the, the police counterterrorism team came in and the army were in another place and then there was you know as i say Command and control was basically non-existent. So one team was breaching the main entrance, another team was breaching from another floor and coming down, and they were having you know guys with guns and shooting at each other. And they actually killed team members on each each side, shit, the shit. police and the military. And how long were you there? I'd say all in all about four hours, four and a half hours. Hmm. Yeah, maybe a little bit longer. Um, do you maybe know how many terrorists were there? You, you know, know I, I can only say what I seen and what I was told number wise from, I would say 10 plus, but they say four. Mm-hmm. You know, I would say they said none of the terrorists were killed by anybody. I shot one of them. <laughs> so, you know, um, but then the CCTV miraculously disappeared mm-hmm. as well, you know. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> is what it is. So we, nobody knows what happened. Basically, No, I mean, then. look, it's bad. It's like deuce it. It's bad publicity to turn around and, you know. You know, Chris, not his real name, but Chris, uh, you know, who went in Obi-Wan, Nairobi. I mean, he probably cut that down by two days from a siege perspective and Mm -hmm. countless people survived because of what himself and Dan and the guys did that day. You know, again, you know, certain parts of the world, you need to have guys like us who do what we do. Because we might be the first responders that are there. You can't always wait for the the, the 999 and the blue lights to turn up, mm-hmm. you know? And that's what we're saying. If you can, we had said it from the start, you know, give us some weapon systems and we'll be able to at least contain, push them into a corner, you know, engage with them effectively. But, you know, again, governments don't want to hand over, outsource, you know, counterterrorism, right, do they? Yeah, but but what I remember right now is that um, first I want to say, yeah, you know, like it's Africa and less developed countries. But then uh, another example popped up. Um, what was it? Uh, Texas Uvalde, mm. where there was a shooter in school. Where essentially, you have like the number one country in the, the lead in counterterrorism and they have like really good police forces yeah but are good they training yeah okay i guess not are, that good. are they just because just because you're in a uniform you got a gun doesn't mean you're well trained true yeah but and also you know you have america or the states are so big that maybe they're good in a one state or one city we don't know yeah and i mean you got to look at a lot of swat teams out there as well their direct action is is serving warrants you know yeah don't get me wrong it's dangerous what they're doing but you know it's no more dangerous than any other police force. You know, you look at mm. serving a warrant in London. You know, those guys aren't armed. They got body armor and helmets and a shield and a bat and a pepper spray. But they're <laughs> serving a warrant, the same warrant that they'd go in with a, an armored vehicle and knock the side of your house down. You know, or pull your door off your hinges. Of course, there's an escalation. But, you know, the proliferation of firearms in Europe is, for bad guys, is probably just as bad as in a lot of other places, you know, the US included. But then you look at Bataclan, for example, the attack in Bata, you know, the, the terrorist, the marauding terrorist attack in Bataclan. And this is something that came out afterwards because I say I used to lecture with NATO about this whole marauding terrorism, as it's been coined now, um, for, for force commanders to understand, you know, what's the response to this. And we we're saying, look, you've got to look at the ex guy or the guy who's not on duty, who is confident in their own ability, who will go and have a look. And they might be able to, you know, uh, establish, you know, a safe haven or move a couple of hundred people, which you know no longer have a responsibility for, you know? Um, and the fire, the guys who who kind of engaged, not engaged, but got into Bataclan first was the Paris Fire Brigade. <laughs> the Paris Fire Brigade are part of the military. So every one of those guys was a soldier first. So they understood ballistics and where bullets go and, you know, so that, that I suppose I spoke to a lot of those guys afterwards and they're like, yeah, you know, we're, we're soldiers. So we understand you know, what's cover, what's not cover. So that was a big kind of leap forward in the mindset for, from a first responder perspective to go, you know, like if there was a terrorist attack in Ireland, 
and the fire brigade turned up, these guys are firefighters. They're not military. You might have one or two guys who were in the military, but they're not equipped for that. They're equipped to fight fires. They don't have body armor. They don't have mm. helmets. You look at the trauma teams in London now, and even in, 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 in mainland Europe now, Holland and stuff, they have specialized uh, emergency response teams and they're, they're kitted up with body armor, with, with tourniquet, you know, all the stuff they have for themselves, helmets, yeah. ballistic visors. But so at least they're somewhat protected going into that environment. It's similar here. No. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's that's the evolution of, you know, uh Bally, <clears throat> Westgate, uh, you know, Badaclan, you know, London Bridge, London, um the other attack in London, um, um, you know, <coughs> and then the other amount of Ducif, you know, and then the other amount of tax and all the attacks mm. we've had in Europe. So that's what I'm saying. And we were going on about kit and equipment earlier on. It evolves, it evolves, and it evolves because people are involved in this and they either transition out of the force to go, but you know what, I wish I had that when I was there. Or you were saying about the training facilities, training centers, you know, no government has the answer to everything. But if you can pull in subject matter expertise from guys like me and other guys who have been involved in this and we can sit down and go, hey, you should really listen to us. You know, we can develop a training package and it can only get better because the next time there's attack and one of guys like us are involved or even the security forces, we can sit down and we can analyze that, extract all that information and develop a training package that we'll put out to you guys, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, definitely. And if you think about it from this this kind of point of view, um, you can definitely see um, kind of correlation of of off duty or ex military or ex police, ex special forces guys that are put in this kind of situations by accident or just by chance. And if they can, they usually are the ones that try to solve the situation or at least help. You know, yeah. um, it's also it's also interesting how similar the the you know the things with the local police departments and everything was in this case and with Dan's case, right? Yeah, but also like, do you remember the the failed terrorist attack that happened, I think, between Belgium and France or something mm. like that on the quick train where just like some off-duty off duty, yeah, yeah. Marines, I think, yeah, yeah, disarmed Guard, the guys. Yeah. So yeah, the, the thing is that, yeah, sure, it's, you know, you, you have, you need to have the knowledge to do so and the skills. But also, like in your case, you need to be the right kind of stupid. If yeah, no, I use your term, no, no, you're right kind of stupid. Because a lot of people, kind of stupid, yeah. yeah, like like you said, you, you mentioned, you know, that they are like sheep. Like a lot of people just they are not used to this kind of situations, and or is it just maybe their um, kind of uh, response to crisis or to shock? They they just you know they blank out and yeah. they do follow the others, but follow it's like, the, the mess. What is to add here, like, you know, your set skills and you know how you would respond. But of course, 99% of people don't like when you like I because of the line of work we're in, I met with, you know, I know a lot of people. And when you see a hero, well, I don't know why I use the air quotes, but like a hero like that was in through some bad shit. It's never the, you know, six foot seven for you Americanski. So a two meter, 150 kilogram guy, it's it's just a normal guy. Right. And it's not about muscle mass or anything. It's no. just so like me and Giga don't know how we would respond because we were never in that mm. situation. But you know, because of your previous um, encounters, let's say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's muscle mass. It's actually muscle memory. And that's the, the, the one between your ears, Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's from drilling, drilling, drilling. You know, you go to the range and you, you, you know, you shoot range practice and you do the same range practice every day for seven weeks. You're going to be pretty good at the end of that. And yet it's something you'll find hard to forget. It's like the medical side of stuff, you know? you are practicing, you know, medic and SF medic or paramedic, or whatever else, you know, that's, it's hard to forget that. That stuff comes back in a flash. It does genuinely, you know? And I think that's the problem, yeah, not the problem, but that's the issue with, with, you know, Joe Public. Because Joe Public aren't exposed to that. You know, they go about their normal lives. You know, there was people there, it was a Saturday. Could have been anybody, your family could have been there. You could have been there. Mm. It's a shopping mall in Nairobi. It could be a shopping mall down here. Yeah. You know? Um, who knows? I mean, that's what it is. And, you know, okay, you guys have, you know, an additional skill set just from doing what you do, right? But Joe Public, who just went there to buy a new pair of shoes. Yeah, but that was my point. We, okay, we, we are sport shooters, we mm. shoot, but the reality of the situation is that 
I personally don't know how I mm-hmm. would respond because I was never in that. I can say now, yeah, I'm a hero. I would go, I would take my Glock and I, you know, yeah, yeah. you can say that, but you don't know. Because, no, the reality is very yeah. different. Mm-hmm. I mean, Maybe. even, but even for me, I mean, again, anybody who says any different is going to be a liar. I mean, unless you're in, in your, in your black kit and you're stacked up in your team and it, you're doing it as part mm-hmm. of your job. Well, then you know you're going to do it. But mm. I mean, I could have easily just sat there and went, no, oh, fuck that for Game of Cowboys. Yeah. You know? Mm. Fuck Again, this, I'm going home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially kind of stupid. That's and what then I say, I'm going to you know? go home and my wife will, will say, again, <laughs> you said never again. Yeah, because she, she, yeah, look, again, <laughs> she was like, yeah, you're in Nairobi. Is there something going on? And it's like, I've seen you on TV again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, here, I just want to mention that um, we're talking about like specially trained guys that are confident in their skills and like it was a part of your job, for example, like the con- counterterrorism. But also, I think like civilian guys or women that know how to use guns can sometimes help a lot. Uh, for they example, can, yeah. yeah, the Dickens guy. Yeah, they can help, but they can be a hindrance. You know, that's the other that's side true. of it. Because, that's of I course, mean, that's true. Look, don't get me wrong. There's, a, there's always, you know, I'll always take a guy with a gun over a guy without a gun. You know what I mean? Um, or a girl. Uh, it's it's awareness, and I think it's you know, the world is changing. It's very dynamic, you know. Uh, the bad guys are always one step ahead because we're always reactionary, you know, always. So it doesn't matter if you're a CT team, you know they're in that building. You just don't know how they're going to react. Are they just going to go and clack and take the whole house down with them? Hmm. You just don't know. Like happened in was it Belgium? They took out the whole or the UK. <laughs> I can't remember. Anyway, these things happen. You know, so you can train and train and drill, drill, drill. The more you train, the more you drill, the better you'll be. The better your mm-hmm. reaction because you'll understand. And then, you know, like in the military, one of the first things they teach you as a brand new soldier is a firepower demonstration. This is what a bullet does. This caliber bullet does to a piece of wood, to a car door, to a window, to a breeze block, right? To give you an appreciation, understanding, not like Hollywood, you know, that a table is going to stop bullets. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's going to get chewed up, you know? As we say in the military, cover from view is not cover from fire. Yeah. You know? That's interesting because I think that's missing in Slovenian military. <laughs> um, <laughs> we don't do that. Um, but uh, what I wanted to do, uh, wh- what I wanted to mention is uh, I, I had in mind, uh, uh, what's the guy? I think Dickens. Mm. Um, he's a regular guy in, in the States where he stopped a mass shooter um, in a mall. Yeah. The shooter had an AR, started to shoot at people, and he, he just drew his firearm and a gun, a handgun, and I think he shot him at like 40 yards. That's the guy in the church. Uh, no, 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 uh, he he shot the attacker with one shot, headshot over the whole yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah. Right, 45. And no, it, I think it was actually three, three, 57 mm. uh, SIG. <clears throat> so really quite powerful round for a for semi-auto handgun. But what I want to say is like, even even like concealed carriers, civilians can help in situations. Of course, you know, you can have e- even Look, problems, even as we had said all along, even just, just containing the situation, mm-hmm. you know? But again, <clears throat> there's the legalities and there's everything else. You don't want What's wanna, your take on, on private firearm ownership? I mean, look, I have privately held firearm. I'd always, if, if at all possible, anywhere I am in the world, want to have a privately held firearm. I mean, the first thing I did after Westgate was go and speak to my boss and say, I want to buy a gun. And they went and gave me the money to buy a gun, you know? So absolutely, 100%. I believe, but it should be not just, you know, again, different countries, different things. You guys have a great over here. You can actually, you know, do effective training. Spain, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's Olympic shooting, one hand, 25 meters. You know, I run a Glock 26. Olympic shooting. <laughs> in Olympic shooting, you know, I still come in the top 10, you know? Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's and, good. <laughs> you know, they laugh at me every time on the range until I pull my target back. And it's a Glock fan. It's an unmodified Glock 26, yeah. you know? Um, and I see guys, tank folios that are like four and a half thousand euros. And, you know, I'll do my practice faster than them. And I'll be, and my box packed up, my glasses put away by the time they're firing the last shot, you know? Um, it is what it is. I have it. I go through the, 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 the yearly practices and everything else because I want to keep my, my firearm, you know? It pains me not to be able to train the way I should train or, you know, would like to train. And um, so it's nice to come over here and actually get onto the range and do some 
Where uh, uh, where in Spain are you located? I live in Canary Islands. Okay, so I was in Canary Islands two weeks okay. from uh, this day, almost. Uh, the flight is 150 euros. Yeah. You can come train here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. I mean, look. And by the way, <clears throat> what's with all the, you know, British people at the Canary Islands? That's it's just it's cheap flights. Just, it's like 150 euros uh, from England too, and, and the alcohol is cheap. And climate, probably, climate, because yeah, it's like I mean, the same the whole year, right? Yeah, all year it's round, awesome, yeah, right? yeah. I mean, a little bit cooler now for us who live yeah. there, but yeah. No, it's it's, look, it's a great place to live, cost of living, easy to get in and out of, so yeah, 100%. You know what I love the most? Beer on a highway is one euro. Like I said, like, this is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. It's the place to live, paradise. Okay, in the whole circle. Well, no, because you cannot shoot. <laughs> you, can, you, you cannot train, obviously. Yeah. Well, this was an amazing conversation. No, thank you, guys. Yeah. Um, I, I think if you're willing, like next time you come to Slovenia, we should do another podcast. 100%. Yeah. I, I, don't think like any, I don't think of any more lies to tell you. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. you know? I, have to, I have to go at least two weeks and make up some more. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, this was one of those podcasts when I personally knew, and I think Giga also, like just be quiet and listen. Uh, and this is the the least talkative I was in a podcast. So that means that it was very, very interesting also oh, for very, me. Very, very boring one or the other. Right? <laughs> no, no, that's good. Thank you very much. For Thanks, problems, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's go for an... Absolutely. Coca-Cola. <laughs> or two. And that's a wrap. That's a wrap.